Got the, the Nuremberg trial as a backdrop here. Yeah. Oh, nicely spotted, Echo. Um, <laughs> well, that's why it's called the tribunal. You know, we're, we're holding these movies <laughs> to account for everything that they have done. Yeah. All right, everybody. So uh, welcome to the third episode of the Despots Tribunal. I've got my guest in here, uh, Echo Chamberlain. So, and hello. Greg Owen. Uh, hello, uh, thanks very much, lads, both of you, for coming onto the stream. Echo, do you want to yeah. introduce yourself? Uh, well, I've been yeah, making videos for about a year now, and uh, uh, coinciding, I think, with the cultural end times, uh, from Galadriel to Velma to everything else. And um, yeah, I've just been uh, burrowing away, trying to make as, as many videos as I can and try to get to the heart of the right state of Hollywood and uh, doing live streams when I can. So it's good to be uh, here with you guys. Yeah. And uh, I'm Greg Owen, same thing, about uh, what, it's uh, 14 months at this point, and uh, same deal, entertainment, pop pop culture, and uh, bringing, just bringing that dad energy to the space that I do so well. <laughs> nice. I think your channel's about the same, almost exactly the same age as mine, Greg, about 14 months. And yeah. It's astonishing when I go back and look at the, or, like my early videos, the quality is is. Incredible. It's it's almost like self parody bad. Like it's a, I knew how bad the quality was and was almost parodying myself. But when I go back and look at your earlier videos, the sound quality is probably the biggest difference. But it, there's still like legitimate videos. It's not like what I was doing. It's um, uh, I I actually thought the sound sounded okay back then, and then I got a real microphone, and I every now and then I get a I only have like two I think two videos that I left up. I made a few, but they weren't good for the channel, and I I delisted them. I think there's only two that, that I was using this like little tiny desk mic. It was like 20 bucks and I'm, I'm recording in my bedroom at that time. So you can just hear the echo and people comment every now and then. And I'm just like, how did you make it through 30 seconds? I can't watch those videos with how bad they sound. <laughs> I'm impressed that people make it through because it's all well, the audio is it's everything. It really is. Yeah, it is. And I used to be audio, so neurotic about uh, I used to be so neurotic about sound that I would literally turn the fridge off just <laughs> because I thought it might uh, create a bubble. You know what? I, Echo is so smooth. I thought you had an AI thing going on because your delivery is so smooth and the audio is really good. I thought you were making yeah. those with an AI like you plugged the script in. I'm amazed yeah. that you're reading those yourself. It sounds great. Yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword there because if I get uh, like a, a couple of comments saying, you know, sounds like bot or something. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that's good in some ways that it, I've got a rich dulcet tones, but if people are just assuming that it's AI generated, then uh, <laughs> kind of take some of the effort out. So I don't know. All right, well, let's uh, let's get started on the topics for today. So uh, first of all, Grand Darkfang has uh, given me $50, which is massive. Thank you very much, Grand. And he says, good afternoon, Despot. I'm a big fan of your work, especially the historical lessons you managed to put in your more recent videos. I'm working on a story. I wanted to know if you could recommend anything on Warrior Queens, historical or fictional. The only Warrior Queen I know a great deal about would be Boudicca. And her story is amazing. It's got everything. Rebellion, uh, sex, love, you know, betrayal, all, all the tropes of a, of a great story are there. Um, even genocide, if you really want it, it's not well known, but there is, it's theorized among historians that she, once she took a Roman settlement, she basically just killed everyone. But at the same time, she might not have been able to do anything about that because her army was just a giant army of drunken Britain warriors. In fact, that's why they lost against the Romans. The army got drunk and then they charged them in a forest and the, the Romans formed this kind of jagged line. Uh, I can't remember what the name of the formation is, but it's a, it's a really good battle. And, uh, the. Britain's got slaughtered, but that's a that's the, the whole story of Boudicca is amazing. It is it's a little bit of a cliche as far as warrior queens go, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff you could do around that. Like um, talking about some of the other women who were involved in Boudicca's camp, or even tell from the perspective of like uh, the warrior wives, the women who would follow in the followers' camp and the and the wagons and things like that, because it's interesting to get a different perspective on war. If I if I were to write a historical fiction novel myself. Um, I would probably read it from the perspective of the slaves following Sherman's army marching to marching to the sea. Um, you know, when they when they went on the long march and they burned Atlanta, they picked up a, a massive tale of like of a hundred thousand slaves at one point of, of free free people. They had been slaves that uh, ran to join Sherman's army, and that would be really interesting to get the perspective from the slave perspective, the the people who were following Sherman's army, because if they left 
the general safety, like within a like a half mile radius of the army, the Confederates would pick them off. That would make for amazing TV, by the way. Um, if they if they made that a TV show, that would be incredible because you have like mm-hmm. the army, then you'd have the slaves, and you'd have the Confederates. You could do those three stories um, on the long march, but Hollywood will never do anything like that because it's it's not terrible. So, yeah, no, there are things on that. Yeah, there's ahead, so much. Well, I mean, just like a, a they they don't. It's it's amazing to me that they don't do uh, stories like that or like the there's the story a uh, story of the uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, which I think was uh, World War II, or you know, there's all kinds of amazing, inspiring. Like you know, they want to do the representation thing, and I think that's great. They want to tell black stories. I think that's a really good idea. And rather than make them up like Cleopatra, they don't want to tell the real ones, which I don't understand because that's actually inspiring because it really happened why wouldn't you tell that story yeah that's incredible i mean the 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 number of stories you could tell they are amazing the one that i just mentioned that's just one one from the civil war there's hundreds do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. with the boudicca it's, it's such a weird historical anomaly and kind of blind spot how did she rise to power in in normally tyrannical patriarchal society um, how did she achieve everything she did? How did she rally so many forces together? Um, what happened to her? It's this huge, ambiguous anomaly uh, in history that people aren't really aware of. In, in terms of writing for um, the story that you posited, it sounds great. The only issue is in the in the contemporary publishing world, um, as I discovered when I was fooling around with a couple of query letters for um, a story idea that I had um, set in bleeding Kansas, where there's uh, someone who... Uh, or a pair of people who tried to liberate a slave and then their journey, uh, the feedback that you'll mostly get won't be the quality of your writing or the idea of your premise. It'll be, you're not the person to be telling the story. You can't write from this person's perspective. Uh, and so that's where you'll get annulled, especially if you put your idea into, you know, into a Reddit or Facebook groups where you um, test your query letters. It won't be on the quality of your idea. It'll be on... Uh, the voice that you're co-opting or taking and that's not your legitimate voice to express through i was actually i'm actually going to be bringing this up later in the stream um i call it identity hiring because obviously there's diversity hiring but identity hiring is where you you hire your cast usually your director and your writer from uh, from the pers- like the racial perspective there is no such thing but in in the minds of these hollywood types there is you hired from the racial perspective of the characters uh, Blue Beetle is the next example of that. So the the director of Blue Beetle has had two feature films, right? Now, this is a $150 million production. He's had two feature films. One of them doesn't have a Wikipedia page, and one of them is an <laughs> indie movie. And he's been given $120, $150 million production with Blue Beetle. Like, why? I don't know why. Like, he's Latino, and um, the writer is also Latino because it's, you know, it's a Latino superhero, so they have to be Latino. And you saw the same thing with Black Panther. The writer and the director, uh, Wakanda Forever, the writer and the director were black. And you saw the same thing with She-Hulk. They were all women, all the writers and the directors. They were all women, all of them. And the, that's what, you, you, it's so dumb. When you hire on the basis of identity, not even hiring for diversity, but specifically identity. This is a women's show, so it has to be women, or this is a Latino, maybe it has to be Latino. When you do that, you're drawing from a much smaller pool of people and your priority becomes identity, not quality. And you, the result is stuff like She-Hulk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, we're going to see it again. Uh, I'm, well, I guess I'm not sure if I'm going to go see Blue Beetle or not. Like it's, it's one of those things where it's going to be so like, I don't have time to make a million videos. And sometimes I have to choose, like if I'm going to go see something to review, I almost have to think like, um, like I did a review of the turtles and the turtles is so, Nobody's really talking about it. And so the review itself isn't popular. So from like a business standpoint, I don't even know if going to see Blue Beetle is a, is even worth it because who's going to watch the review? Because nobody, a lot of people don't even know it's coming out this week. It's coming out in two days. But we're going to see the same thing with the with the Marvels. The, you have the exact same, like you were just talking about. Nia DaCosta was, she was got, uh, got onto the Marvels. And I, at first I was doing some research and she had um, uh, in the woods or Little, Little Woods, that's what it was. And then she did uh, Candyman. And then I realized after I posted a video about that, Candyman wasn't even done when she was handed the Marvels. Like they started production right as that was finishing up. So that wasn't even out. They didn't know if it was going to be successful. She literally had one indie movie on her to her name and then a couple of like short films and commercials. And then they were like, here is the flagship of phase five 
<laughs> go ahead, run with this. It, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane what what they're doing. Um, in terms of, and it's also because she's a woman, she's going to be moved up the ladder faster. This this was a point I made in my uh, recent Indiana Jones video I did. Um, Phoebe Waller Bridge on the back of Fleabag. Now that mm -hmm. was a fairly successful kind of indie show. I've not seen it. I've seen little bits of it, and it seems quite good. It seems like a, a decent show. It's not what I would watch, but I would accept that it's it does seem pretty good. And because of the success of that, and because it was well received, she got just catapulted right up into the higher echelons of Hollywood. Um, actually, over the course of my research, have you seen Solo? No. Uh, you know what? No. That, that was when, what did that come out? Last year, and I didn't watch Miss Marvel. I didn't watch Solo. There were a few Disney Plus shows that I was just like, I don't, no, no. I can't keep up with all this. I don't have yeah, time Solo for all this. The, 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 the Star Wars story. Yeah. The, the movie, Solo. Mm-hmm. Um, she actually played the droid. You know that annoying feminist droid, or not feminist, no. like droidist. I suppose you would call it droidist <laughs> droid. Um, Is this the droid that gets plugged into the Millennium Falcon and essentially becomes yeah. a kind of soul for the spaceship? Yeah, she, like in a, in a movie that bad, she was somehow the worst character, and that was Phoebe Waller Bridge, apparently. So this mm. this like uh, Indy Five wasn't even her first Lucasfilm bomb. Mm. But uh, anyway. for some reason that makes me think of uh, like the um, that deadpan blonde bobbed. Uh, soul of the computer in Red Dwarf. <laughs> That's why I imagine uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge oh, being God, like Red in, Dwarf. <laughs> and, you know, I, I haven't seen. She, she has like a. She's got a specific kind of humor, and I, I'm with you. I haven't seen Fleabag. I've been. To, my wife tried to watch a couple episodes. She said it's like. She sees how it could be funny, but it's it's kind of gross, and so it, you know it's it's that kind of humor that might make you feel a little uncomfortable. And if you're a you know it's that kind of black cynical humor, which works. Like I'm I'm a fan of that sometimes. But then when you try to take that and put it into Indiana Jones or she's going to completely screw up uh, Tomb Raider, like that tone doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in Solo. It doesn't fit in Indiana Jones. Like it only works in stuff like Fleabag. And, you know, I don't, I don't, and like you said, she got the one success. And I'm like, cool, try your hand at everything else. And it's not it's not going to work. Yeah. It's, well, it's her, her, Go ahead. Echo. Her, her thing in Fleabag is um, it's self-deprecating that she's aware of her own gangliness and aware of her own, you know, lack of particular attraction. Um, almost like she had a precursor in that similarly tall, awkward, self-deprecating woman in Black Books who was like, um, you know, one of those co-leads. Uh, but yeah, so if you take that persona and then you put it into Indiana Jones and then you try and make her also... Um, a femme fatale who can, who can size up men on a boat um, and has all these other characteristics that expand out from that. Uh, her character just didn't really seem legitimate or authentic in Deanna Jones because they're trying to expand on something that's not ideally to be expanded on from her original character that made her have an appeal in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, they're trying to. I mean, my theory basically was that she's a female Indiana Jones, that they literally take all the Indiana Jones tropes and they force them onto her character and it gets very absurd so for example when she back jumps onto the back of a car and she breaks the window open with a bottle and then one of the, the the henchmen sticks his gun out presumably to try to shoot her i don't know why he didn't just shoot her from inside the car he decided to stick his weapon outside the window and then presumably turn it sideways i don't know why but she grabs his arm and, and starts hitting it off the car frame <laughs> and it's just so absurd i and i under people the response that I get when I point these out sometimes in my videos, but somebody will say, "Oh, come on, man! You know this is a this is a, a story where ghosts flew out of the Ark of the Covenant. Are you really going to criticize a guard boss?" But those people are confusing realism and believability. Mm -hmm. The ghost coming out of the Ark of the Covenant isn't necessarily realistic, but it's believable within the context of the Indiana Indiana Jones story world. If you're going to give me a super strong woman, that's fine, but you would need to explain why she's super strong. Is she in possession of some? sacred relic that is making her super strong maybe that right. would be acceptable but no she's just she just is just just run with it guard boss par it's like well, you, can, you can really feel the reshoots in that one and the unconfirmed rumor that is that she was going to be indie so i guess it would have made more sense for her to do the indiana jones stuff because originally according to rumor she he dies and she goes back in time and then they rewrite history where she you know basically uh, picks up whatever Raiders of the Lost Ark as him, uh, yeah. you know that that was that was what they wanted to go with, and it, you know, like 
maybe that's just made up rumor but the the problem is the the movie was so terrible and what they did with the character makes it believable like it looks like that's what they were going to do and then the ending just comes out of nowhere with the reshoots yeah so the, she was going to go back go in time and then uh pick up as him and so retroactively go through the original films the implication being that she would be the character instead of him throughout those films was that a mm -hmm. suggestion that's amazing that's the most uh chutzpah thing since they tried to retroactively do doctor who and have him completely reinvented from the beginning as uh, a new, I think it was a female black character they had as a, a, a new doctor. So to, to retroactively go through, not just replace your hero, but retroactively go through to the beginning of their journey and yeah. recontextualize it. That's, that's amazing. Rumor was that Bob Iger made the only good decision I've heard from him. And he apparently came in right after Chapek. And I guess the rumor is he heard that and he was like, no, 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 we're not doing no absolutely not i'll can it if we're not going to reshoot it and then they they reworked it and hence the delays and all that and then the ending of course just like doesn't make any sense and they're like just punch him out and that's it that's then there you go that's how the movie ends okay <laughs> well we'll get on the indie five a bit more um in a little bit as we move on but i i did want to start things off po as positively as possible and just talk about our your favorite movie of the year so far because we're going to be talking about nothing but shite here <laughs> oh, by the way, for everyone listening, uh, just so you know, I don't monetize these live streams because I would make so little money off the monetization of a live stream that it's just not worth it to inflict ads upon you. So if you are listening, you don't have to worry about uh, ad breaks. This is just a demonetized stream. So anyway, um, the, my, my short list for basically good movies so far this year, the best ones that I've seen are Tetris, Blackberry, Mission Impossible Dead, Reckoning, Across the Spider Verse and Extraction Two, and f for myself, my favorite one out of all of those is Blackberry. Uh, somebody mentioned Sound of Freedom in the comments. I actually haven't seen it because it has it, it has, just hasn't come out in the country I live in. Uh, I live in South Korea, and it's not out here yet. I, I don't think it will come out at all. I uh, don't think the South Korean market would respond to it. But um, yeah, Blackberry. Blackberry, I thought was terrific. It's the only movie I've seen this year, which is genuinely laugh out loud funny. Uh, it's got this hilarious dichotomy between this uh, kind of business shark and this startup of geeks that are playing Doom on their computers in the 90s. It's it's really good. Uh, great acting, great script, uh, very well paced. And there's some really, really satisfying dramatic character arcs that go on throughout the story and a lot of symbolism as well. I would need to watch it again to really get it. But I find that all great movies, they work on a subconscious and a symbolic psychological level. And there's, a, for example, one of the characters, he starts out as a geek and he becomes more like a shark, more like the business shark. And there are times where you, you see the scenery around him and it's kind of um, the, the lighting and the scenery looks like the, the, a shark's bite kind of surrounding his head at times. It's very clever. It's, it's very well directed. And, and I love stuff like that because I think that that's necessary for a movie to be really great. Uh, I love Blackberry. I thought it was a terrific movie. And it's the kind of movie you could not make in Hollywood because it's just men, right? It's men doing business in the 90s. Yeah. And, and there's there's like one female character and she has one or two lines. You couldn't do that in Hollywood. It, it, that, that can only be an indie movie now. But I thought it was really good. Uh, Greg, what about you? What's the best movie you've seen so far this year? Um, I know that I guess it came out Christmas, but I didn't see it till January. So I'm going to sneak in Puss in Boots to the last wish. Uh, I, I felt like that was, I mean, that was a near perfect movie. I felt like even though it was, you know, a lot of people were just like, oh, it's an animation. It's a whatever. It's a sequel to Puss in Boots, which was, you know, just kind of came and went. Nobody really remembers that movie. Um, but it's, it's a very good story. It's got excellent themes. It's got really good character development. Uh, I, I love I'm a huge fan of this new art style, this new kind of uh, blocky cell shaded sort of frame rate playing around stylized thing that we're seeing in Spider-Verse and the Turtles now and Arcane and everything. Um, but I, you know, uh, the the whole found family thing speaks to me. I'm, I have a real soft spot for that. So I like that anytime it's, it's worked into a movie. And I, I just, I feel like the, I loved it so much. I had to make multiple videos about it. It's, the the way they use the villains to drive home the themes of the movie and they kind of play back and forth um where you know you've got the dog and 
and Puss and then all, you know, your various antagonists and villains. Death is an antagonist. I was told that a lot in one movie. He's not a villain. He's an antagonist. I just got tired of saying the word villain. So I threw or antagonist. So I threw word villain in there. Um, but every one of them in their own way illustrates this, this theme of gratitude and, and, you know, really paying attention to what means the most in your life. And it was a very deep message and it was illustrated in multiple ways, both positively and negatively. And I was just really, really impressed with, you know, I went to just go eat some popcorn and watch kids animation with my mood, with my kids. And I mean, I was emotional. I was crying in the middle of that movie. It was excellent. Uh, other than that, I think, you know, Spider-Verse, I think is on the, on the short list for everybody. It's just, it's really good. It was a great, it was a great story. I think there was a lot to dissect there. That was another one that I think what I like about that movie is there's not one, like one solid takeaway. Like I, I wanted to be contrarian. So I made a video about uh, Hobie and that he was actually sending the opposite message that he was like they were making fun of these anti-capitalist cool guy video on that was really good you I know buzzwords that. um you know and I, I thought I was you know I had like a different take there and people disagreed but I love the fact that that was such a complex character that you can pull both of those ideas and and really nobody's wrong and nobody's really wrong about their takes on like their multiple ways to view Gwen their multiple ways to view Miles you know, is Miguel actually right? Like, I thought that movie was so well done in that it didn't just smack you in the face and say, this is what you need to know. You know, take this away. They were really great characters that we could have legitimate disagreements on. And I think that makes for a great movie. That's good writing when you give the uh, the audience something to think about and not just, a, you know, a fortune cookie wrapper or, or a message to take home. And, and here you go. This is what we want you to think. The other thing about Spider Verse, the and all that's true. That especially the Spider Punk character you were talking about, he's he's really funny. Um, and like you said, you can take him both ways. You can either take him at face value and treat him as what you would have, what five years ago you would have referred to as an SJW. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call him woke. I think there's a there's a different. The SJW's kind of graduated to this almost religious fringe group and became woke. But he's he's what you would have called a SJW five years ago. But I, I don't necessarily take him at face value. I think your interpretation of him as a kind of parody <clears throat> of that university campus liberal liberal is is uh, is correct, especially when you look at his lines where he says things like, I don't believe in consistency. And he says it with uh, it's hard to tell if he's joking or if he's serious, but he's probably serious when you look at his character actions. Yeah. But the best thing about that, like not the best thing, but one thing about that movie that I loved was the soundtrack. It's probably my favorite OST of the year like the, the the music for spider across the spider verse is excellent it's got a particularly yeah. great song called start a band if if you want to listen to just one track check out start a band it's a brilliant song what about you echo what's your favorite movie of the year so far well i wish i could just choose sections i wish i could say i want to have the second act of oppenheimer i want to have uh, the 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 second set piece of extraction two I want to have the first act of Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, but I can't do that. So I guess I'll have to go with um, Tetris, which I think came out earlier this year. Um, because I have a, a real affinity and love for films that are about someone or a group of people scrabbling and fighting over intellectual property, over a new product, over a new idea that everyone can feel deep in their bones is going to be a smash hit. And I love that the avarice of that and the desperation, the visceral intensity of people trying to screw each other over, of, of trying to do deals. Um, so like the founder or uh, the social network or uh, Blackberry or, or this, uh, I love that when there's ambiguities about who's going to secure something that's going to become massively huge. And especially if there's the ironies that the audience has about the sheer scale that these products will have when they actually do come to fruition uh, it, it, a bit of a letdown towards the end where it sort of um, goes a bit zany with a car chase that you know obviously didn't happen in reality but f f I mean just if you can get away with a film which is probably about three quarters maybe even 90 percent people in rooms but are still crackling with tension and suspense uh, over deals then I think that's a success as a film and Taron uh, Egerton as we were saying before great actor very versatile and uh, very compelling on screen too. So that would be my one. Yeah, I actually love the car chase in Tetris because I thought that it was a very self-aware parody of those kind of spy movie car chase things for a couple of reasons. <laughs> so the, the mm. movie knows what it is. The movie knows that it's mostly guys in rooms um, arguing over and, and shouting about this, this 
IP video game that they know is going to be a huge hit. And they're aware of this, and they, they decided that they've got all this this Russian spycraft going on. And I think that the filmmakers made a very conscious choice to do a parody of the spy movie car chase, the inevitable car chase through a city center, which is impossible <laughs> because mm. have you driven in a city center? You're going to drive it 10 <laughs> miles per hour and, and, and you're not going to be able to move. Even if you did want to speed, you couldn't. The traffic's too jam-packed. So they're ridiculous, those scenes. And in this, I think that's a party for a couple of reasons. First of all, the music. The music is I want a Russian version of I Want a Hero, which is oh really God, classy yes. and really cheesy and over the top and hilarious <laughs> and works perfectly. Secondly, yeah, yeah. it's the car that the Russian's driving. He's driving this... this is it a ladder, this, maybe? I don't even know what it's called. It's this really mm. beat up, tiny Soviet red car. It's hilarious. Like, it's just a mm. hilariously terrible car when he's driving <laughs> it through this car chase scene. Um, and whenever the cars hit something, they pixelate. So they turn into yeah. 8 bit pixels from the like late 80s, early 90s. Um, mm. and, and I think when you take those three elements together, it's clear that this scene is just a bit of fun. It's a parody of this, the, the Spycraft car chase. And I just thought it was a great scene. It was beautifully filmed. Uh, as as mm. far as car chases go, it's really well filmed. You, you look at some of the car chases that you see. I mean, I'll give you probably the worst example I can think of is Quantum of Solace. There's a car chase in the opening of that movie. And it's edited so... I'll just... I, I, oh, I'll just yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I remember. Like yeah. spastic editing. It, it is the most <laughs> frantic... Um, ADHD crazy all over the place. Cut, 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 cut. It, yeah. It's it's impossible to tell whose car is it belongs to who or where they're going. Or it, yeah. it's impossible to follow. It's just an absolutely mind-bogglingly hideous scene. And they think that but, creates ten. They think they think it's going to create tension or it's going to look you know like exciting. And really, you just end up being bored. You just yeah. I don't even know what we're doing. Yeah, this is a big change for me now because if there's a fight sequence or a car chase scene, I just find myself braced and clenched and in a kind of hiatus just waiting for it to end because I want to get on to the next thing. Like watching Mission Impossible, <laughs> it's a fight sequence in uh, in Venice and they're on a bridge and it's punch, kick, swivel, grab, hold, melee. And then a fight sequence on top of the train yeah. and it's punch, kick, fight, swing, melee, mad, thousands of cuts. And I just feel desensitized to it now. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, um, all right, so let's one move. point. Go ahead, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you just said, no, you were, no. I know we we're in a good secret invasion at some point, and I the the only um, the only thing nice I can say about that show was that the fight scenes were actually more grounded. They weren't the big Hollywood affairs that you know there are boring. They were shorter and they were a little more. I don't know if it's realistic because I've never been in a real fight, but they just um, they felt different. They felt a little more intimate, I guess. And the, that was the one. The, well, that and Ben Mendelsohn. That was the only good thing that show had going for it. But I, I liked that that they did that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been, I, I did boxing for three years, and as far as real fights go, I mean, it depends what you would define as a real fight. There's this debate, you know, what's what's better for a real fight, boxing or MMA? And, I mean, the answer, I, I, very briefly, the answer is boxing, because mm -hmm. for the vast majority of people who do MMA, they're not going to be athletic enough to make full use of it, and, and they're, they're not going to be big enough or strong enough. Mm -hmm again, to make full use of the techniques they're doing, whereas anybody can throw a punch, really. You train somebody for a year and get them to throw 10,000 punches, they're going to be able to hurt someone. And when you throw a punch at someone's face that they weren't expecting, they're not. They're almost certainly not going to continue fighting because it really, really hurts. Um, so I would say boxing for self-defense is probably the best thing. But in a real fight, it doesn't matter. The winner is the guy who picks up the chair fastest and hits you know the other guy over the head with it, or the first guy to pull out a knife. Real fights are short. Like mm -hmm. in, in a word, a real fight that you would see in the in a street or a bar, they're very, very short. Um, and that's the yeah. big difference between Hollywood and real life. Uh, in a real fight, someone's arm gets broken in a few seconds or they get a bottle hit over their head. Or um, one guy realizes very quickly that he's he's going to lose the fight and he just backs off. And he feels, oh, well, you know, I, I threw a few shots so I can see a face. But yeah, real fights are over very, very quickly. The only fights that last are with trained fighters who who know what they're doing. A couple of things there. Um, what I miss is two things. One is a fight is bit, uh, like the stalking is a, a great element of a fight in film. If you think of something like Blade Runner where Dick is being stalked in that entire last 20 or 30 minutes, 
that's the exciting bit is the thrilling idea of the chase that there's someone prowling around and you're trying to desperately get away from them. And that's more interesting than almost than the fight itself. And the second example I would have is something like uh, an alien when Ash attacks Ripley. That fight is uncomfortable. It's it's weird. It's strange. Uh, the decisions they make to fight are awkward and and it's it's deeply unsettling. And that's what you know fighting is actually like. So those kind of things where there's tension and there's build up and um, you know it's that there's an unsettling discomfort. Uh, that's way more interesting than just watching like a computer game sequence of two people brilliantly choreographed because you're watching choreography and it, it, you know you can see it. Yeah. Well, and, and I think unless you go, if, unless you take it all the way, like I've heard people refer to John Wick as a uh, a ballet of sorts because it's so choreographed. It's all about the visuals. It's it, mm -hmm. they they go all the way with it, and that's what makes it so visually appealing. Yeah. Uh, and that was why, like, I haven't seen Transformers yet. I'll probably rent it, but uh, I saw the the previews and. You know, the fight scenes look huge. And like you said, it's they're cartoon characters. I mean, it's just it's just massive amounts of CGI. There's just robots and stuff all over the place. And I even the trailer, I thought, eh, that looks boring. It's just, you know, it's just <laughs> motion on screen. Mm -hmm. Another thing that works well with fight, fight scenes is an element of the unknown. So probably the greatest example of it in really in cinema history is The Empire Strikes Back, where Luke goes to fight oh, Vader. Yeah, of course. And he, yeah. he, he begins the fight by, by um, holstering his his uh, pistol, his, his blaster, because he knows that it's not going to be any use to him against Vader. And the, from the, and he goes into very start, it's very slow at the start, but from the audience's perspective, we have never actually seen Vader fight. We can, it's easy to forget mm. about this because we've seen so much Star Wars, especially nowadays, it's so over fucking saturated. But you go back to when the Empire Strikes Back came out and people, the people who are watching that for the first time are like, oh my God, like, how is Vader going to fight? What's it going to look like? And Vader ends up absolutely trashing Luke. Um, and there is an element of the unknown there because you don't know. What, and like Luke, you don't know what Vader is capable of. Um, and with a modern director, that probably they wouldn't have been able to do that. They would have ruined that. They would have had Vader, Vader like killing people at the start when he invades Hoth. And that would have kind of destroyed it because it would have given away his, his abilities and his powers. And we don't want to see that. We want to be in Luke's Ooh. perspective. We want to be afraid like what is vader capable of and as it turns out yeah he he, uh, he was very capable of killing luke and decided not to um which is one of the reasons that is in my opinion and it's it's not just that it's also the direction and i'll give one example yeah. of this if you look at uh, when luke <coughs> goes into the sky room where you know the sky room with the giant chasm uh, watch mm -hmm. the lights the lights are blinking orange and yellow and that's just to to build visual tension at a kind of psychological level for the viewer it's not something you necessarily notice but when you do realize it and you're watching out for it it it's uh it really adds to the to the scene and it also foreshadows luke's um you know his, his defeat because it's like blinking emergency lights it's it's one of the my favorite scenes in terms of direction out of any movie but that's uh the sound design ahead. is also beautiful with these uh the sound design with those those low um, throbbing computer sounds and uh, industrial air vent sounds and the claustrophobic tunnels um that that whole sequence is probably still one of my favorite in all of cinema and it goes back to that idea i was saying before the stalking the hunting the idea of prey uh, of what could be around any corner um those strange lulls between the fight between hectic intense heart pounding action and then those unsettling lulls of being stalked. Um, that's what I like. That's what I want fights to be. So yeah, you, you came up with a perfect example. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's so let's move on to our next topic, which is Barbie. Uh, I'm, I don't want to talk too extensively because I know it's been talked to death. But I'll I'll just give my own very brief take because I did a very long video on it, so I don't think my viewers need me to bang on about it. But uh, my fun, I, I hate it. And uh, I, I hear quite. Like, it's not. Yeah. Um, it's not difficult for me to hate that movie, and it's not necessarily. It. It it's video. not necessarily because it's a feminist movie. I can accept the movie being feminist. It's just it's a, it's a different political perspective that I don't agree with. You know, I, I believe in plurality and all that. But the fundamental problem for me with the video was a, a couple of things. Or sorry, not the video, the movie. <clears throat> First of all, it glorified power. It suggested that power was a fundamentally good thing and that women should have it. Uh, and um, I don't agree with either of those. But then again, I don't really think men should necessarily have power. I think that power should be viewed as something that is the essentially a, a, 
a side effect of responsibility, not something that you pursue for its own sake. I think anyone that pursues power for its own sake, it's essentially, it's just evil. And that's not a word I use much, but if you want to accrue power for its own sake, that's just a bad thing. Because what that shows is that you want to exert influence over other human beings, but you don't even care uh, what what you bring to the table. Like, what are you going to do for these people? Because that's what power is. It's the ability to influence other people's lives. So you want to influence other people's lives. Fine. Okay. What are you going to do for them? I don't care. I just want power. Like, that's a really evil perspective. Um, and and this, it doesn't matter what perspective you look at Barbie from, from the perspective of um, what Barbie should be doing for girls. We should be making them powerful. Uh, from the perspective of the director, oh, well, you, Barbie didn't make girls powerful, so it's not good. Or women don't have enough power in the real world. That's bad. Or women have lots of power in Barbie land. That's great. It, wh whatever perspective you look at the film from, there is a glorification of power. And, and I, I absolutely hate that. Um, and there's other reasons I hate it as, as well, which I'll, I'll not get into too much. But that was my main problem with it. Uh, Greg, what did you think of it? Because I know you saw it yesterday or the day before. Yeah, I just saw it last night. Uh, went with my wife and my 15 year old who uh, my 15 year old didn't like it. Thank goodness. And my wife said she was uh, she was just bored. I mean, like <laughs> just, just from a story perspective, because she doesn't. Uh, it's funny. We, we talk about movies and stuff. And she's like, you look you like to look into the themes and the what are they trying to say and all that. And she's like, I just like to watch a movie, you know, like I just want to see a story and that's fine. And she said, just from that perspective, it was just boring. It, it's not a it's not an entertaining event. It's not paced well. The storytelling is not great. Um, and I think that what's really sad is you can kind of see what Greta was going for. Like she wanted to do like a parody type thing, like an idiocracy, which I think is a great movie still holds up to this day. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons that that succeeded and Barbie failed is that in Idiocracy, they were willing to make fun of their main character and they were willing to make fun of everybody to prove this point that we're all just getting dumb. And and the main character, he's an idiot and he's useless and he's the smartest guy on the planet. So what's to say about everybody else? And they weren't afraid to take him down along with everybody else. Uh, but with Barbie, they wanted to do like a parody thing. And at first, like the first 20 minutes, actually, I think it was a really successful movie like um they do the space odyssey smashing of the dolls and it's really over the top and you get the sense right away that they were aware how over the top and just silly that was like to make a movie about Barbie and then compare it to arguably, you know, people consider this to be the greatest scene in filmmaking. And, you know, they, it seemed like they knew how dumb that was and they were having a great time. And then they go into the explanation of the Barbies and Helen Mirren is narrating and she's like, they think it's great. And the Barbies, think that because it is in their world and they have no idea how messed up the the real world is and it all seems very self-aware and just being fun but they couldn't let that go they, they couldn't leave it at that they also wanted to, to put that message in there and they were so focused on it that it ruined the last two-thirds of the movie because they couldn't decide which message they wanted to tell you know at some points the men being in power is like you said power is good power is bad you know, when the women do things, it's good. When the men do things, it's bad. We're never really shown how they brainwash the women. They just say that they do. As a matter of fact, the only the only group of people we see actively manipulating and preying on people in the movie are the Barbies. They come up with this whole plan to use the men's interests against them and use their pride against them and actively manipulate them to take power back. And it's like, I don't think you realize you you sent the wrong message, Greta. You were trying to portray women as, you know, as great and powerful and, and this feminist message. But like you said, like, that's fine if that's the message you want to go with. But she couldn't she couldn't decide where she wanted to go. And so the movie's just all over the place. The thing is uh, what, you know, you took from it that, that they were portraying power, you know, as, as something that you ought to have. And and that's not good. And I agree with that. Uh, I'm working on a script that. For, for me, it reminded me very much of like a, a pink washed manosphere. Uh, I don't like the manosphere. I don't like Andrew Tate and, and Fresh and Fit and the rest of these guys. I think that they give men this, this um, image that like when you get a bunch of women and cool cars and money and all these external things, that will make you a man and successful and happy. And historic. I mean, every philosophy, every religion on the planet says that's the dumbest idea that that's, doesn't work. And that's what they tell guys is grind and hustle and worship you. And I, the whole time I was watching the Barbie movie, I felt like that was the message they were giving. That exact same message was, you're the most important. 
You're only uh, you're only successful if you have a job or status that other people deem as successful. You're only successful if people are simping for you or fawning over you. You're only successful if you have money, you have stuff. The whole message, as as convoluted and all over the places that it was, the entire message of the movie is you're the most important thing in the universe and you've got to find a way to make you happy. And usually it's external shit that's going to make you happy. And I, that's bonkers. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I, I agree with all that. Echo, have you seen it? Uh, I haven't seen it, in fact. But uh, I've, I feel like I have in a weird kind of existential way because I've seen, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen so many reviews, I've seen so many clips, I've seen so many takes. My interest is um, the Barbenheimer phenomenon of um <laughs> got a little guest uh the barbenheimer phenomenon of um people who went to see both films and i'm interested in that particular cadre of people who got super dressed up in pink and they went with their friends they're gonna have a great time whoa and they're gonna see barbie and it's like a huge party and then okay now great let's go across the hall and let's watch uh, oppenheimer <laughs> uh, just picture them two and a half hours later watching uh, mr strauss uh, you've come before this panel to uh, discuss the uh, the ramifications of your thing <laughs> okay it must have been such a come down after the party atmosphere of barbie uh but from what i can tell from barbie is that there's no sense of uh equilibrium that uh, neither barbie nor ken goes any kind of particular arc where they you know discover the the issues or faults in their nature and have to correct them. Uh, so it doesn't seem that either character especially course corrects. And it seems like you you were saying, Greg, that uh, the director didn't especially know which way to go, that there's too many takes that she wanted to squish into it. Yeah. So I will get around to it. But then again, maybe uh, maybe I'll, it'll be like a, a solo or Star Wars story. It'll be something that I'll pride myself on never actually having gone to see. <laughs> All right, I'd be I'd, I'd be really I'd be really interested to hear your take on it. Although, yeah, I reckon you'll you'll see through all the nonsense. I, I also I, I can't stand how it's been lied. It's been lied about twice now. So the first one was that it oh it's just a, a basically a romp, come a romp, a fun summer romp for everybody, yeah. and that was the marketing campaign. And once the cat was out of the bag and everybody knew what it actually was, the narrative switched to oh it's satire. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. really believe any of this. It's just satire, you know. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And if you don't agree, you're an incel. Well, um, and that that's part of the the mixed messaging is that at first you get that impression. You really do. I, I, like everything from the beginning of the movie, all throughout Barbie Land, pretty much until Barbie leaves to go to the real world, they like the narrator tells you everything in Barbie Land is not real. Like none of this should be taken at face value. This is all like they think it's perfect, but it's really not. And so they. At first, you're like, okay, they're doing this. They're doing a parody. They're doing a satire thing. And I think you're absolutely right that they're they're going to go with the, um, oh, come on, you're taking it. It was just a joke. You're taking it too seriously. And, but like the speech that America Ferrara gives at the end, or, you know, every time they reference the patriarch, all this kind of stuff, like there are serious messages they wanted to get across. And again, I don't think they realize how you're, you're on both sides of the issue when you try to say like, oh, it's just a joke. We were just, you know, it's parody. It's just fun. Well, then, okay, if, if that's what you want to go with, then I'm not going to take any of your messages seriously because it's not clear which parts of the movie that you wanted to be serious and which parts you don't. And the reality is they only want to be joking when it's convenient because when they get called to it, like, hey, you sent the wrong message here. You made the men look actually sympathetic and beat down and they were like slaves. And then that's when they go, ah, we were just we're just fun and we're just having a good time at that point. That yeah. wasn't a serious part. You're you're taking it too seriously. A weird thing is a, a poll came out today, I saw, I think it was on uh, Politico or something like that, where two thirds of people who have watched Barbie now say that they feel uh, they can recognize or they see uh, the patriarchy in their workforce. So that's one takeaway. That's interesting and uh, obscure idea. It's funny because they never say what it is in the movie. They just say that it exists and it's bad and it's basically it's men. I guess that's what patriarchy, I don't know. They never really go for it. They just, it's uh, its one of those things where I think the people that made the film, they already had an idea of what it was and they just sort of assumed that we, the audience, also agreed. So all they had to do was just go, patriarchy exists, it's bad. And then we would all go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the other problem with the movie. They they suggested that patriarchy is bad, but they didn't actually give a reason as to why it's bad. So, I mean, to, to go back to Star Wars, um, the Empire is bad okay that's fair enough but you need to give me a reason to to agree with you there like why is it bad well they're bad because they blew up a planet okay fair enough 
Like there right. you go. Okay. I see it now. Um, yeah. But the, the the patriarchy in in Barbie is supposed to be the villain, but from the perspective of Greta Gerwig, the director, the patriarchy is self evidently bad. She doesn't need to explain why, so its destruction at the end is self evidently good. And that's just it. That's how brainwashed she and and coastal elite types yeah are with well, uh with, with feminism they they don't even conceive of the notion that maybe patriarchy has actually been massively beneficial for humanity in that it got it got us from the stone age basically to the 1960s a society run by men and you you want to criticize all of that and cast that all aside and suggest that there's nothing beneficial about that I mean, do you think that, you know, we've got it oh so much better today than we did in, say, the 1940s, the 1950s, or or before that, when people generally, you know, they weren't offing themselves in large numbers and women were considerably happier, um, despite, you know, not having all of the modern conveniences and, and the modern medicines that we have? Are you, So mm -hmm. they're just going to cast all that aside and say, no, it's all self-evidently bad, yeah. which I think is a very, you know, historically myopic and narrow-minded narrow -minded perspective. Well, and then in the movie, it's funny well, too, I made because this idea, the patriarchy uh, is also stupid. I'm sorry, go ahead, Echo. Well, I'm, uh, I made a video where I was exploring this, where um, there's two sides to this, or two elements, which is one, you've got this idea of the patriarchy, which is how power is regulated uh, and controlled and apportioned out in society. But in modern society, the cultural messaging that we receive is largely coming from women. The vast majority of marketing graduates who make the advertising that we watch and consume and the messages that come to us from that are women. The producer levels up in the tier um, in the Hollywood system are mostly men. But if you isolate it just to who's in the writing room and who are the story editors, the majority of them, according to um, the, their own reporting and internal reviews, is women. So they're the ones who are actually crafting the message and the characterization and the narrative emphasis. Uh, public relations and communications, the majority of people in there, uh, by graduates and by profession, are women. And in the humanities, which is where um, ideas are propagated about identity and all those other things, which eventually make their way into think tanks, which eventually make their way into policy, uh, the vast majority of people in the humanities, uh, graduates, etc., cetera, are women as well. So there's two tiers. One is the literal power and how it's apportioned, which is patriarchal. But the communicate the way in which we receive messaging about our society and societal and social narratives is largely women dominated. And so people, I'm trying to make this idea that there's these two strands, these two tiers, because it can feel confusing for people that we hear about the patriarch all the time. But the social messaging we're receiving all the time is a very different story and kind of disconnected from that. So I'm trying to get those two strands as an idea you laid yeah. out i saw that video and you laid it out really really well it remind when i was watching it reminded me of this scene in uh my big fat greek wedding which is classic i love that i'm not even joking it's a great movie and mm -hmm. there is this scene uh where the mom the greek mom is talking to her daughter because her dad and her are not getting along because she wants to marry a non-greek guy and she's like i can't do anything dad said no whatever and he's the head of the household and her mom gives her this great line she says the man is the head of the household but the woman is the neck and she can point the head any way she <laughs> wants to. And I, and yeah, that, yeah. when I was watching your video, I was like, that's, that reminded me of that, that you're absolutely right. Like behind the scenes, they're the ones that are pushing kind of the nudging the direction we go. Yeah. The CEO is a man, but really does he micromanage the day-to-day -day stuff? Absolutely not. No, he's concerned about shifting I the product and, on, and making the connections and stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say I wanted to move on to the the Barbenheimer effect, and I'm not I'm not referring to the meme. I'm just referring to Barbie and Oppenheimer coming out at the same time, and the effect that that's going to have on Hollywood moving forward. Uh, one thing I will give Barbie credit for, which is related to what we were just talking about. You're talking about how uh, our society culturally is um, very geared toward the the female perspective. Barbie is actually a movie for women. Like I mm -hmm. will say that. This is not a castrated male franchise, which is then paraded in front of women and, and women are expected to show up. Okay, it's not Indiana Jones 5. Like I would, I would call Indiana Jones 5 a, a castrated version of the Indiana Jones franchise where basically they, they take Indiana Jones, he is now emasculated, and then they replace him with this woman. And because she's a woman, now women are expected to show up for this IP. And that 
isn't the case. The vast majority of fans of Indiana Jones are men because Indiana Jones is a male. It's a male power, kind of a male power fantasy, but it's it's a male good guy fantasy in the same way Bond is a male good guy fantasy. So you look mm-hmm. at Bond. What what does Bond do? So Bond has sex with beautiful women. He gambles in casinos. He kills very bad guys that want to do very bad things, and uh, he 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 gets to travel the world and play with all the man toys and everything. But he does it for his country. It's not for himself. It's for his country. It's for queen and country. Right? That's why he's doing it. Um, so it's this male fantasy of I, I get to do all of these things that I know are immoral vices, such as sleeping around with lots of women or going to casinos and gambling lots of money or, or drinking a lot or, 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 you know, flying around the world as opposed to, you know, settling down and building a family. These are vices. These are things which hold men back. But in the case of, but you want to do them, right? Instinctively as a man, you, you want this at a very base animal level. But Bond gets to do all this stuff, and he's a hero, not in spite of the fact that he does it, but it's a necessary part of his heroism. So that's very much the male fantasy, and that's why it's so popular with men. And then it's popular with women because they like Bond, they want to fuck him. And you look at Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is kind of like that. It's kind of like that. Indiana Jones gets to, Jones gets to kill bad guys. He gets to, you know, usually has sex with like one or two women in, in the movies, um, one, two, and three at least. In the original trilogy, uh, he'll he'll get some you know hot girls, and he gets to go after the artifacts and beat the bad guys, and he's he's doing it all for uh, for the good, for the greater good. So it's kind of similar to that Bond fantasy. Now, when you emasculate him, you remove that completely, and he's an old man now, so he's not as attractive as the ladies. You know, no harm to Harrison Ford, but he's uh, let's just say he his chances of pulling from a nightclub would have been better 40 years ago than they are today. Yeah. Well, he's 80. Um, I mean, he, he, looked good. <laughs> he looked good for 80. He I did am... look good. He did. I will give him that. I think he looked good and he, and he, his movement was pretty good for a man of his age. And I'll give yeah. him credit for that. I will. Um, because I think it's very important to stay healthy, even at a, 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 a old age. I'm, I'm not just going to say we should cast old people aside and forget about them. No, they need to stay healthy too. And I think Harrison Ford looks good for his age, but you, you so the, the female, aspect of the female fantasy of you know i want to go to to go to see this male hero when action is gone and then you've got the male fantasy which is gone because of the emasculation of the character so what's left and that that's kind of what kathleen kennedy had in mind she's she's going to create take this franchise and make it for women but it's not for women no one wants to see that now the only people that showed up were the legacy fan base and i guess people that were i don't know fooled by the trailer because it did sell i think it it got the 400 million so you know it, it did have an audience yeah. Um, it was just massively expensive, which is one of the many reasons it flopped. But if you look at something like Barbie, Barbie is actually made for women. It's big and pink, and Ryan Gosling is half naked for large parts of the movie, and all of the cans are shredded and, and look really good, and, and they're really good looking, handsome guys. And it, it's glossy, and it's got all the costumes and the dance numbers and the songs, and it's got all this very feminine it's it's really ironic it's a feminist movie but it's also very feminine it and it's got all of these these surface level glossy things that women love to see in movies and that they haven't been able to go out and watch in movies for a long time because all they've been getting are these castrated male franchises and it Mm -hmm. sucks if you're a woman like we often bitch you know and moan online about how all the male franchises are being destroyed star wars is the classic example star trek's Mm -hmm. another one but at the same time what is there for women what are they making that is uniquely appealing to 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 women to the the female mind at least barbie was that at least it was appealing um on that level and i will give them i will give greta gerwig credit for that she made a movie that women actually want to see yeah no i think that's a great point that uh, you're, you know, we, you're absolutely right. We look at it from our perspective. That yeah, they're we're, they're ruining things that we like. But you're 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 right that they're also handing women these reheated leftovers and telling them you're welcome. And it's like for what? For for seeing Phoebe Waller Bridge jump around and try to be snarky when it should be an Indiana Jones movie? Like that's not what we asked for. Yeah. All right. So looking on at the the Barbenheimer effect. So I I think possibly. If Hollywood take the right lessons from the success of particularly Barbie, there will be less fan bait advertising as a result. Um, just to give a quick example of that, if you look at the Velma trailer, um, Velma, in the first Velma trailer, she parodies 
what she basically parties internet trolls. So she says something like, if there's one thing we can all agree on, agree on, it's that you should never change anything ever. And uh, she, she's suggesting that anyone who criticizes Velma is racist and wrong and a troll and backwards. And this was a fan bait trailer. Uh, Velma is quite an extreme example, but the Woman King was another one where they were basically trying to start a race war to promote the movie. Um, so I, I think that when you look at Barbie's advertising, one thing that it suggests is that, and, and that's this is the other thing, the fan bait stuff. All of these these uh, franchises that were promoted through negative advertising and fan bait, they all failed. The like the yeah. Woman King flopped pretty hard. Velma mm -hmm. was an absolutely miserable failure. Like nobody stayed around for the the whole season. Rings of Power is another one. The first thing that came out of those idiots' mouths um, in, on the Rings of Power promotional tour was how amazing it was that there are different people of different color. And finally, you know, black people or brown people can look at Rings of Power and see a reflection of themselves reflected back at themselves. By the way, that's more or less a verbatim quote from one of the actresses. <laughs> And it was it was very negative. It was very anti tolkien It was like, well, Tolkien was wrong. We've we've improved Tolkien's world, and it was very fan bait. And it again was a flop. So what I'm taking from Barbie is, will Hollywood learn that lesson? That negative, call it fan baiting if you want, but basically negative advertising doesn't work. It gets a lot of free social media attention. That's true, a lot, and it generates a lot of YouTube videos. But that does not translate to box office. It's not enough to just get people talking about it online. You have to get them in the theater. And I think that, or, or you have to get them on the, you know, sitting down at home to watch the stuff on streaming. And I don't think that uh, the negative advertising works. I think what Barbie has proven is that a positive marketing strategy is far, far better than a, a negative fan base strategy. Do you think that Hollywood will learn that lesson and apply it? Or are we likely to continue to see the same kind of negativity and fan base that, we that we've gotten used to? There's a lot to unpack there. I think um, a lot of that is dependent on the idea of to the extent to which you see Barbie as a singular film. Um, that <laughs> uh, there's also the uh, the second fan baiting tier, which is um, about two weeks after the release, they have one of the stars uh, for some reason sitting in a car because I think that looks more authentic and relatable, and then <laughs> berating the fan base for uh, you know not connecting with the product or for um, attacking one of the stars. That never works. That always backfires as well. My little conspiracy theory is that the studios have like a set structure of a car on the lot, which their star can just go into, and uh, that's got all the cameras set up and everything. Um, yeah, and with Rings of Power, if you lead with identity politics and you brazenly push that forward in a provocative kind of way, in a disproportionate way, you know, this is the thing that we want to push, and we know it's going to be controversial, but... Uh, you know, you need to grow up and accept it because this is uh, the level that we're going to now. So come along for the ride. Otherwise, you're a reactionary. Uh, so it's that disproportionality. And I want to introduce the term of uh, uh, identity junkies. Copyright. That's my new term. I'm I like using it. From <laughs> yeah. I think um, they, they might learn a little bit of it that, you know, the marketing was it was good because it created curiosity. You know, I mean, we all know that we have to create these thumbnails that sort of, uh, you know, get people to, to wonder what's in that video. I want to click on that video. And I feel like they did a great job of that where I, myself, I was morbidly curious of what the hell could a Barbie movie be about? And I on a, on a base level, I just I got to know. I want to know what they're going to do with that. So I think some of it is unique to that property because. You're like, what the hell? Are they gonna, how are they going to make a Barbie movie? You know, what's what's that going to be about? But I think what's going to come out of this is that you're going to see Hollywood try to recreate the Barbenheimer meme, and they're going to try to force that. And anytime corporations try to do memes or like, I mean, you just look at all of their social media feeds. I think that's what they're going to focus on is they're going to be like, wow, these two things came together and everybody loved it. And that's why it was successful. And we need to recreate that thing. And that's going to be hilarious to watch them try to recreate it. <laughs> They've already yeah. tried with Saw Patrol. Have you heard about Saw Patrol? No. <laughs> Is Saw, Saw 10 Dying. coming out on the same day? So, uh, <laughs> same week or same day. So Saw 10 and oh. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, which I'll actually be oh. going to see. Uh, that'll be the first movie I take my son to in the movie theater. Um, so I'll probably be seeing both of them, but I suspect I'll be one of the, you know, the, 
there'll be very few people on the planet who actually go to both movies in the theater. The because right. Paw Patrol is specifically for basically toddlers, like little yeah. little kids. <laughs> um, but you know who who in the right mind is going to go see Saw Ten and Paw Patrol? Um, right. I, I don't like that's a that's a corporate meme. Whereas, and I quite liked the whole Barbenheimer meme because it really helped out movie theaters. They were struggling after our next topic, which is the flop buster summer. Mm -hmm. uh, just a bunch of movies came out that were expected to be billion dollar hits and they all bombed. Um, even Mission Impossible. Was I was flopped. surprised by that. Um, mm. and, and I, like the movie theaters really needed a win. So I was glad that the, the internet culture was able to create this Barbenheimer meme and give them a break and, and get them some sick ticket sales because people often forget about that. And yeah, so I liked it for that reason. And I thought it was funny. I didn't take it too seriously. Some people thought that, oh, I, you know, I hate this, this corporate, this is just corporate nonsense. No, it, it was grassroots. It came from the internet. You'll yeah. know it when it's corporate because it will suck. Like when corporations mm -hmm. try to create memes, you, oh God, it's, it's just, it's actually it's funny so, how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, it's contrived and artificial and you can smell it a mile away. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Awful. There last month uh, on Instagram, there was a little trend going around where people were making their own little Wes Anderson movies. And there was, you know, a specific sound and people were doing little cutesy Wes Anderson things and they were adjusting stuff and it was all bright and colorful and all that. And and then a couple of course, I saw a couple of sponsored bits where people tr like companies tried to, to do it. And you're it's, oh, it's it's disgusting. I think something else that the Barbie uh, somebody <laughs> in the comments mentioned, Rachel Zegler, who's everybody, everybody rightly loves to hate right now. She's everybody's favorite bad guy and, and she deserves every bit of it and i think that they were very smart with the press tour for barbie they didn't give away too much and they certainly like you said they didn't shit on the audience where we see zegler right now some i don't know who at disney is allowing her they need to lock her in a room somewhere because she's pissing everybody off even people on the left are tired of hearing her and she's going to tank the sales to snow white before it even gets out because no i i honestly think that hunger games is going to suffer because of her because nobody likes a, a, a 22 year old, 21 year old that thinks they know better than everybody. And they're so smart. I mean, she's coming off like an edgy 18 year old who wants to tell you how great atheism is or something like it's it, she's insufferable. And you didn't see Margot Robbie doing any of that. You didn't see Ryan Gosling doing any of that stuff. Whenever if they if they talked about it at all, it was just like we had a lot of fun. Come see it. It's a great, fun, poppy, colorful movie. And they left it at that. And I I do hope that they learn from that because the box office speaks for itself on this one. Yeah, the shit that that we girl has been coming out. Go ahead, Echo. I'll, I'm just going to, I'll just end up, you know, ranting better if you talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you guys see her, um, uh, her little, uh, she joined the writer's strike and she was talking about her own um, issues about having to be, on set in costume for eight or nine hours a day and, and the pressures and difficulties <laughs> that, that she said yeah that, that was so that's, uh, you know that, what, was that, that was to be fair uh, you know when she said you know it's not 1937 that's why it's going to be such a good movie and um, that mm -hmm. kind of annoyed me because i thought you know she's she's kind of disparaging the generation of human beings that destroyed the japanese empire and the, the nazi empire which were <laughs> two of the greatest evils in human history yep. um but the thing, but, the thing when, that i but, yeah go ahead one thing i will say is when she said that she had to be in costume for 10 hours a day, that's when I really felt for her. That's when all the hate just disappeared. And I was like, oh my God. It's terrible. Like, if only I'd known what she was going through those, you know, those days I was yeah. working in a Pizza Hut kitchen or, mm -hmm. um, you know, running after kids for minimum wage in a kindergarten or something. I, mm -hmm. I, I would have I been grateful for my position because at least I don't have to stand in costume for 10 hours a day on a, on a movie set. Well, we all remember when I think it was a John Hurt who had to be the Elephant Man and have that costume, uh, that makeup put on for slathered for six hours in a chair. We all remember how we went in in, in public and talked about it a lot to elicit sympathy, um, you know. <laughs> uh, but the thing I look out for now is uh, I like to see when things like The Daily Beast or Slate, kind of those uh, those pop culture websites, when even they get a little bit um, distant and, and dubious about um, uh, too much identity politics and entertainment. So with something like Snow White, people might give you one, like uh, you're going to have a, a Snow White who's not actually Snow White, but they're not going to give you two. So if you have magical people, if there's two dumb pop cultural memes simultaneously on a product, then I think you have a mainstream audience who are going to go, eh, 
Yeah. I didn't know about this. And you've got three because the prince is no longer the, the she's not chasing after true love. That's right, ladies. True yeah. love is stupid and dead, and you should not try to be in love ever. That's dumb. That's old fashioned. And I don't even know if she watched the old Snow White because she, I guess in one interview recently, she said that uh, the prince can be different because in the original, he was a weird stalker. He was stalking her through the woods, which is not, uh, that's not what happened. I mean, that's just objectively false. That's not what even happens in that movie. And I know she thought it sounded clever, but it's just, it's, it's not at all. So yeah, you got a, you got a third thing there that, uh, they're they're ditching the prince for a different love interest or no love interest. She's a self saving princess. That's the cool thing. It's mm -hmm. it's and they'll probably uh, give yeah, uh, it's the, also just the, um, probably give the evil queen a little narrative arc as well. Well, she'll be uh, proven to actually. Oh, she'll be, she'll you know, definitely be. Um, yeah, well, not good. She'll be morally ambiguous because villains are never just mm -hmm. villains anymore. Like it's actually yeah. refreshing when you see a villain who's a villain. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's it, it's really fun I, I did this um kind of not it was kind of a parody of rings of power it was it was my idea for rings of power season two and my one of the so i would identify a problem and then i fixed it um and for example like i said uh sauron isn't he's not alpha enough to conquer middle earth so i made him watch a bunch of andrew tate videos to get him alpha like, for example <laughs> and one of one of one of the problems i identified is that it doesn't have a good villain Rings of Power does not have a good villain, so I just made a villain. I, I pulled a character from Silmarillion at random because that's basically what they did with Rings of Power, um, yeah. called Maglor, and he's a real villain. Like he just will go to a village and, and torture young women for amusement, um, and he gets involved in a war for sheerly, purely like basically Victor spoils reason. Very, very Mussolini. He just wants a seat at the table so he can get some land, get some money, get some trade deals. Like he, he has no moral compass whatsoever. He's he's just an evil villain. Um, and that's what that that's great because Hollywood never does that anymore. It's, it's just um, it's it's all these ambiguous villains. Like no villain is allowed to just be a villain anymore. They always have to have a backstory, especially in these bloody Disney remakes. Like in the last one, Laurie eighteen live action remake eighteen, uh, the Little Mermaid. They had to give Ursula a back a very vague backstory mm -hmm. that she was yeah, like oh, yeah. a sister <laughs> and and she yeah, had yeah. been cheated out of the throne. <sighs> Every bloody time now. And so that would definitely the, happen for the for the queen in, in Snow White. Uh, there's a little bit, I don't want to get too like uh, intellectual here, but in, in Jungian psychology, the idea, these fairy tales are so resonant and they last the test of time because they strike deep at um, psychological impulses in people. That's why they endure. And the idea in these things with this recurring archetype of the evil queen or the evil stepmother it has this psychological basis in Jung and psychology of the idea of the devouring mother, that it's a, a an archetypal character that you need to escape from in order to become fully um, idealized uh, as you, in your own identity. Uh, and so this idea of Disney where they're taking these characters and recontextualizing them as sympathetic in a way, like there's a, a kind of insidious undertone there about um, the nature of the lives of the writers and their inability to individuate and, and become strong, uh, you know, individual people. So uh, at a, a kind of psychological level, it seems a little amiss to me. It's yeah. also very conservative. That was a point that I made about Barbie. I, it was, in a sense, it was a conservative movie because it's a movie about a group of women who essentially work to restore the Bourbon regime after it's toppled. It, it's a one of the fundamental lessons of Barbie is loyalty to power. And if you look at a, a movie where the devouring mother figure is treated sympathetically, because the, the devouring mother is an authority figure, right? The, the Queen Snow White mm -hmm. is an authority figure. Ursula is an authority figure. If you make yep. them sympathetic and you try to get the audience on side with them, what you're essentially saying is, you know, you should never question authority too much. Try to think of it. Try to think of things from the perspective of power, from power's perspective, from the perspective of authority. That's what you really want to do. Um, that's a that's a message which suggests that you shouldn't try to to change things too quickly, and you should uh, you shouldn't rush to criticize uh, established power. That's quite a conservative mm -hmm. message, actually, in an ironic sense. But these morons don't know that because you know they don't know their arse from their elbow. Yeah, you know, it'd be funny got to... to see them try to redo some classics. Like I would like to see 1985, where we explore how Big Brother is really. It's it's tough looking after everybody and keeping the polls. <laughs> and and yeah. that, we give you this know, two minutes. Hey, come on, everybody. what else do you want? Good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, like Cruella Deville recontextualized as uh, you know 
not only sympathetic, but sassy and sexy uh, and misunderstood. Um, so when you have the positive mother figure, it's usually always the, the fairy godmother who only appears and apparates into the scene from time to time just to give that extra boost and to give you you know, that, that lift and to give that extra bit of power and support and then disappears again. So that's the ideal mother figure in the fairy tales as opposed to the, um, the evil one. So if you're trying to take the evil devouring mother archetype and recontextualize it, like I said, I think that that suggests some some dubious things going on in the minds of these writers. Um, well, before we move on to our next topic, I did just want to ask one more thing. Um, it's not necessarily about Barbie. It's just will Hollywood try to replicate this IP by adopting other toys or doing something similar? So, for example, when Rings of Power came out, there were a bunch of knockoffs, which which all failed, basically. that Some of them did attain a very mild level of success. Uh, I've got the list here. Wheel of Time, which was a failure and terrible. Shadow and mm -hmm. Bone, which I attempted to watch on Netflix. It sucked. Uh, the Last Kingdom, Vikings, The Shannara Chronicles, which I'd never heard of. Marco <laughs> Polo, Beowulf, The Shieldlands, and uh, most infamously of all, Rings of Fire. So these were all attempts to replicate the success and the lightning in a bottle moment of Game of Thrones, and they all basically failed. None of them mm -hmm. got anything close to what Game of Thrones did. Are, are, do you think we'll see the same thing with uh, Hollywood and Barbie? Are they going to try to recapture that lightning and, and go they're after all, that market again? They're already doing it. Uh, I've got a thing in Parade Magazine pulled up here. They are, There are 14 movies that are in development. And then, you know, a lot of them won't see the light of day. But there is uh, American Girl, Barney, Christmas Balloon, Hot Wheels, Major Matt Mason, Magic 8-Ball, Masters of the Universe, which they've tried multiple times. Kevin Smith couldn't get that one off the ground. Uh, Matchbox, Polly Pocket, Rock'em Sock'em Robots, Thomas the Tank Engine, Uno, and Uno. How the fuck are you going to make an Uno movie? Uh, <laughs> Viewmaster, Wish, and Wishbone. Uh, so right now, those are 14 confirmed properties that are they're somewhere in development of making a movie. So... Yes, wow. they're absolutely going to try to capitalize on it. Mm. Great. What so do you there's been the next... is this is this going to be bad? Like, or do you think it's going to be terrible because we're going to have no, we're going to have half a decade of botched meta films, which nobody wants. It's the opposite direction. People want realism. They want cool stories with cool characters. And now we're going to get it's meta. Do you get how meta it is? Look, it's still uh -huh. meta. You're not getting how meta it is. That's going to be that for five years. I, and I imagine that part of that yeah, will be... Although I will say, I, I would expect so. that almost... Go ahead, Greg. No, you you were going. Well, I'm just so saying, you... I'm expecting them basically all to bomb. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely will. Good, and, and I think yeah. I goes right that the whole time in, during the movie, they're going to be like, isn't it crazy we're making an Uno movie? How weird is this? This is crazy. How, <laughs> how are we even doing this? This is going to be nuts. You can't make a movie on a card game, <laughs> right, audience? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people are going to get epilepsy from from winking at the camera so much. That's going to be the next five years. All right, let's, let's move on to the flop buster summer. So we had The Flash, which absolutely bombed. Indy 5, which bombed. Mission Impossible, which honestly kind of... I'm going to actually look up the numbers on that right now because it, it definitely flopped. Um, Isn't it weird how everyone, or pretty much in the whole YouTube ecosystem, got it wrong on both counts? Everyone assumed that Mission Impossible would have these long legs and be great. And everyone also assumed that Barbie would have a terrible second weekend, and that also didn't turn out to be true. So yeah. everyone kind of in the ecosystem got it a bit wrong on both counts. Yeah, um, uh, Mission Impossible made 522 million, 523 million on a budget of 300 million. So that's basically a bomb. Um, that thing mm -hmm. needed a billion dollars and they've lost a ton of money on that. Uh, and we also had uh, Elemental, which was a huge bomb, and The Little Mermaid. So those th these were all expected to be, for example, the billion, the, the Little Mermaid was supposed to be a billion dollar movie. So it was Mission Impossible. Yeah. Elemental, I think they expected to flop, to be honest, because it's Pixar. Um, it's crazy to say, like, it's crazy to imagine, like, 10 years ago, people would have regarded Pixar as almost a guarantee of failure, but that's that's how far the brand has fallen. Um, mm. No one thought Indy 5 would succeed except Kathleen Kennedy. And The <laughs> Flash, man, see, when you look at the numbers, you, you really do see that superhero movies are just on the way out. I, I'm, I'm briefly going to read a list of DC's recent movies since 2019. So, Birds of Prey, 2019, I think, that bombed. 
Wonder Woman 1984 bombed. The Suicide Squad bombed. The Batman was actually a success. Black Adam flopped. Shazam 2 bombed. The Flash bombed. And Blue Beetle will no doubt be a smash. So those that's are... That's that's basically the rundown. That, that's utterly miserable, you know, when you when you look at those numbers. Um, but yeah, why do you think that we had these... This, this summer of failures. I mean, obviously we'll take them one at a time because maybe there are reasons that apply to all of these movies, but um, just going one at a time, why do you think the Flash bombed so, like, so hard? I think, uh, well, they pretty much told us that there's no need to go see it because they're, you know, they're rebooting the Gunverse and basically they said the Snyderverse ends with the Flash and so the audience was like, well, then why the hell do I want to see the ending movie of a dying universe what is even the point and then you've got ezra miller that you know people don't like him they don't want to go see him throughout an entire movie he was quite annoying and um yeah they just it had everything going against it it was terrible yeah that was the other thing it was just a plain plain and simple it's an awful movie it's it's a kaleidoscopic nightmare of a mess uh, uh, have you, have you seen I... the flash have you any thoughts on it yeah, the um, what I thought was fascinating is the the monumental push that the studio did to try and make it viable, to try and get buzz going. They you could feel them throwing everything into it. It almost became uh, like you you could feel the intensity of that. But it's just uh, it was doomed because Ezra Miller is terrible as a person uh, for about half a dozen reasons, um, and it's a tonal mishmash. Putting in nineteen eighty nine Batman is so incoherent uh, and so bizarre to me. I don't know why anyone thought that would be a good idea or how that would would, would work. The aesthetic is completely wrong and jarring. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I don't understand how that film happened <laughs> or why anyone would have gone to see it. Yeah, I, and I lost count of the amount of times they reshot that. It, it just turned into a massively, massively expensive movie. You know, sunk cost fallacy, uh, they they were 100% right to just can that Batwoman movie when yep. uh, when David Zaslav came in because he he didn't go after the there's this I used to play poker back in the there was a big poker boom in the mid 2000s and I would play it online and one of the the many phrases that that I one of the phrases I remember from it is never send in good money after bad mm -hmm. so if you're holding a losing hand and it's you're not gonna bluff your way out of this there's too much money in the pot already um, just fold. Don't send in good money after bad. Or if you've had a really bad bait, uh, you've gotten very unlucky in a hand and, and you want to get that money back, don't just start throwing chips into the pot because you're angry. You know, Relax and, and move on and make good decisions. Don't throw in good money after bad. And that's what they did with The Flash. They had good money they and, and they could have abandoned it to just, look, let's just... They, they basically did. I mean, if you look at the CGI in that movie, I'm completely convinced that Zaslav at some point said enough we are not spending another cent on this fucking nightmare of a movie. Just release it because the CGI is not finished. It looks horrendous. Mm -mm. Um, that, that ending scene with the with the balls <laughs> hitting each other and then them exploring the Superman and ba Batmans and flashes of the past. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, Actual claymation would have looked better. <laughs> a weird sense of... Uh... The difference uh, distinguishing between actual product or content and cosplay seems to just getting smaller and smaller in distance between those two concepts. Uh, so that's one thing I took from it. What do you think was, how do you envisage David Zaslav's decision, his moment? Do you think he went out into a balcony and brushed his chin and he had to weigh up this, this moral implications of all the work these people did and it was really <laughs> difficult? Or do you think he just like pushed a button and said, fuck off, and that was that? I just, I, I reckon he's the kind of guy that's very decisive because mm. basically what he did with Batwoman, he, he would have looked at it and thought, enough, like, just get this fucking movie out of there. We'll make, whatever we make on it, we make on it. It's cash. Uh, we've already lost. He would have known. Like, he would have known that it's that it's that it was a failure when he when he saw the cut of it. Um, mm. And then the whole Ezra Miller crime spree so that he couldn't promote the movie obviously didn't help. Um, so I reckon David Zazab just very decisively went in and butchered it. I will be interested to see if James Gunn can resurrect the DC. And I could, I, I mean, I, I won't, I can't form an opinion on that because I haven't seen even a screenshot of anything that he's done. But I don't know. Do, you, do either of you have any thoughts on whether or not DC 
can be resurrected by James Gunn? I don't know. I mean, when he released that new slate, a lot of those titles weren't exactly appealing to me, like Swamp Thing or Booster Gold. Like, I don't know. But I don't know. Maybe he's got yeah. one more uh, one more act in him. Maybe he could surprise us all. Yeah, I although if he thing... feels that's it, I reckon for... Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Greg. No, I, I just think the only thing that the whole the whole deal has going for it is that it does have one guy in charge. He has a vision for how it's all going to connect together. I think the the cinematic universe is a little played out at this point. I don't think the audience is going to, they're not going to watch Swamp Thing on HBO and understand how it ties into, you know, the Booster Gold show, how it ties into mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, Batman love and something movie. Um, I don't think the audience is going to do all the homework to see how it connects. But the one thing that it does have going for it is that you do have one guy who's got one vision and it's it's not like the the the, star wars trilogy where they were like all right you do the first one you do the second one we'll figure out the third one later and then you saw how that ended up where the storyline didn't really connect and they had to retcon stuff and so if there's if there's one sliver of hope for dc it's that they have one person with a plan and hopefully that will actually work out yeah i will say i think that if you're going to give it one that dc had two choices basically they can just they can put it they can put it all in a fridge they can take all of these ips and just uh, put them on ice for uh, the foreseeable future. Because you, you can't afford to keep spending money at, uh, on these productions. They're so expensive. Or you could give it one last shot at a reboot. And I think uh, as far as the, their decision to bring in James Gunn went, that was a good decision. Um, he's done some very good work over at Marvel. And yeah, the, the, we'll see if it works out for them. But I don't think they could have made a better decision. It was one of those two. The, the second best decision would have been Let's just put them on ice and, and forget about the whole thing and, and move on and try to find some other cash cow. But uh, they're yeah, they're you can understand their perspective. It's kind of between a rock and a hard place. Let's yeah. Well, let me uh, to... ask you guys. Uh, can I just add, add one little yeah, thing? Ahead. I want to get your guys' yeah. perspective. Um, like, if you think of the the um, Marvel's uh, Avengers um, saga or whatever, uh, if you have long continuity over three or four years, it's building up towards something. Uh, if they get that back, either in, in Marvel or DC, and they have like a long established and coherent continuity for something, could superheroes come back? Or is superheroes just doomed in the way that Disco was doomed by 1980 and it's just naturally becomes passe? Uh, I would say it's you know, doomed, but that's, I'm not going to go into long explanations as to why, because it's, it's a very overtalked topic, but I'll just say, I, I think that they're done. Um, I was kind of on the fence on that issue, but when I looked at the numbers, I mean, I just, I, just went through the DC movie since 2019. The Batman is the only one that had any success. Mm. And Batman is, is such a strong established IP. I suppose that was part of the reason for it. But the Joker might do well. We'll see how, you know, Joker will also, I think. But they're kind of almost franchises on their own. I, I will say this. You can't create new superheroes anymore. There was a time like uh, 10 or 15 years ago, you could have brought out an Iron, Iron Man movie. People would have showed up for it. You could have brought a new Hulk movie. People would have showed up for it. New Captain America movie. You can't create new superheroes anymore. You, this is why Blue Beetles, one of the many reasons Blue Beetle is going to bomb is because people don't know who the superhero is. There's no room mm -hmm. left for more names. This happened with the Eternals. The Eternals was an attempt to basically yeah. jam a bunch of new talent, a bunch of new superheroes into the MCU, and it absolutely flopped. There's no room left for any more new superheroes. So even if, and I, I do think there's still a market for superhero movies, and I think it's a large market. The reason you can't keep making them is they're just too bloody expensive to make. We could Spider-Verse, across the Spider-Verse only cost $100 million. Yeah. So that, that's terrific. But if that movie had cost $300 million, it would have been a flop. Right. So um, there is a market there, but you you would need to get the movies done much cheaper. If I was I mean, if it was if 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 uh, DC had hired me, my my goals would have been we're going to make the movies much cheaper and we're just going to stick with established characters, no new characters. If you did that, if you made them cheaper and you stuck with established characters, I think the movies would succeed. You're not going to get back to the billion dollar days that's gone, but you would still be able to make profitable movies at the theater. Um, and maybe occasionally you'd get a, a, re a really popular one. It's never going to be like it was, but the way they're doing it, I think they want to continue to make massive budget movies and to introduce new characters. That's going to fail, in my opinion. I think um, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, uh, the only the only hope that I think superhero movies have is if they try to 
diverge away from the safe blockbuster superhero. Like I, I think Blue Beetle is going to fail because it just feels like, oh, okay, it's just another guy with a super suit. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't really say anything. But then you have shows like The Boys and Invincible, who they're saying something different. What if, what if superheroes were were self absorbed pieces of crap just like most of us, but they had superpowers? What would that, what would that look like? What would they, what would it look like if they actually worked for a giant corporation that marketed them like products? How would that affect how they fight crime and, and what would they do? That's an interesting concept. And uh, the boys is very successful. People like it. It's a little, it's a little gross. It's very R-rated. But um, then you've got Invincible, which is not only animated, but again, asked the question like, okay, what if Superman was secretly evil and he was only saving Earth to bide his time and then, then he's actually going to take it over. But then his son, I don't know, his son convinces him not to. Like it's, it's a different question. Um and I think both of those shows, you, there's a lot of fans for both those shows. And I think their their new seasons are going to do great, especially Invincible, because it's just something new. Whereas Blue Beetle feels so, I mean, I think they started making it six or seven years ago. And it feels like a superhero movie that was made six or seven years ago. And I think if DC wants to be successful, I agree with you that they need to get back to the names that people know. Like, they need to have that Cyborg movie. They need to have a Martian Manhunter movie. They Like, the big names that the common like i don't read comic books so they need to find out what are the dc names that i know which is martian cyborg wonder woman batman superman sure. those are the only ones i know from the dc universe i don't know who swamp thing is i don't know shit about blue beetle and if they want a big audience to come in um they have to do they have to start the way marvel started uh which was everybody's heard of captain america everybody's heard of iron man everybody loves rej and so that got the ball rolling and then they were like hey Let's talk about these guardians you've never heard of, but now you're invested and you'll come see them. And then it worked. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the worst example of that, of course, is the Marvels, where the audience is expected to know oh, who these three obscure characters are and how they how they obscurely relate to each other. That's uh, going to so be so much a train fun. Wreck. Yeah. <laughs> that is going to be so much fun. I'm, I'm really looking forward to just the whole YouTube reaction of that, the videos and the, and the hilarity. It's going to be oh, beautiful. Be Do you <laughs> think that they're going to can that? Seriously, both of you, do you think that they're going to go the, I, the the Batwoman route and eventually, because they've talked about pushing it back, and every time they push it back, obviously it costs more money, you have to market it again, because uh, the, the marketing cycle has already started, they've got toys and McDonald's and stuff, so then they'll have to redo that, and they're going to spend more money, and do you think that they're going to they're gonna pull a, a Batgirl and just decide, you know what, this clearly is not going to work, let's just dump it to Disney Plus and walk away from it and, and quit throwing good money after bad? No, they're definitely going to release it because they, I would, they're not idiots. All right. They are idiots, but um, <laughs> they have good accountants, right? They have good accountants and um, th they're not, they're not blind. They can see, right? They, they can see the trailer. They know that this movie is going to fail, right? Yeah. And their attitude at this point is look, whatever money we make from it, it's money, right? Let's just throw it into the theater. We've already marketed it and let's get what we can from it. The only question is how bad will it bomb? Like that's 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 what I'm really curious about. It is this just this morbid curiosity. It was the same thing with ND5. Now ND5 did not wow, that didn't even crack 500 million. That was that needed 900 million. Like ND5 absolutely created. But yeah, I do wonder how bad will it be with the Marvels? Like that's the question on everyone's mind. How <laughs> bad is it going to be? <laughs> that's so sad. <laughs> When did it start pre-production? I, I think it started pre-production in 2021 or uh, early 2021. I can't remember now. But uh, it must be so weird for these actors and actresses in this zombified states of the products that they make. They've moved on from something that was three or four years ago, <laughs> uh, which is still yet to come out. So strange. They they have to release it just for sheer ego. They couldn't uh, they couldn't abide the idea of, of the product. It would be too much of a uh, of a concession and a sense of defeat if they had to do that. Yeah. So one or the other, just putting it out there. And there's also other market considerations to take into account. Disney's, in terms of their stock, the most visible product that Disney have are their movies. So when a Disney movie does very badly, it is bad for the stock because even though the movies aren't their main source of income, the parks are, uh, it's the most visible one. It's the one that the market will react to most quickly. So if they were to start abandoning products from theater release it's going to shake investor confidence and i think it, they would take a hit on the stock market as a result so at mm -hmm. this it's 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 not a case of um 
they don't even have a choice at this stage. They have to release it, and it has. It's just, it's going to bomb, and that's all there is to it. But one of the uh, actresses. One said thing that, I will uh, say that there's definitely fatigue on. Like, I, like. Go ahead. Oh, um, one of the actresses said um, that uh, the Marvels is going to be it's going to be different because it's going to be zany and fun and not so serious. And I thought, <laughs> have you watched Marvel oh. product of the last five years? So I don't know if that was well, a good yeah. thing. So I think we don't everyone, have to, when everybody heard you know, that they just no thought, more of the existential four, terror four. of She Hulk. <laughs> yeah, no. I I can't uh, one I thing can't I, wait to make money off of the video that we're gonna make. Uh, yeah, by, by, I mean uh, whatever. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make lemonade off of that one. That's fine. <laughs> if that's what they want to release, okay. <laughs> one thing I will say is that I think audiences are just genuinely sick of. Like, I don't think that's the case with superhero movies. Like I said, the vast majority of the ones that have been released recently are shite anyway. And audiences, generally speaking, don't like crappy movies. But one thing I think that, that audiences have had enough of and are just not showing up for anymore, certainly not in the numbers that they did a few years ago, are Disney live-action remakes. I think those fucking abominations are done. You look yep. at the last few, uh, The Little Mermaid flopped, and it flopped hard, um, despite, I think it made 500-something million. And that was a very expensive movie. Uh, they did the Peter Pan and Wendy, which was awful. Yeah. And that generated almost no interest on Disney+. Plus. And prior to that, it was the, the Pinocchio remake. And, and that thing was so obscure and so unwatched that many people didn't even know it existed. Um, mm -hmm. I Unfortunately, I do know that it exists because I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> I um, it. My God, you did not miss it. Like, <laughs> oh, one of the worst movies of last year. Just unbelievably terrible disgustingly bad uh and and i think that the, the 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 reputation of disney live action remakes is now so bad and you've got you know we brats like rachel zegler running around running her mouth and that happens every time now every time they have some annoying race swap and then they've got their main actress out there prattling on whatever shite she's been told to say by the disney marketing department and it's it, it, it's not just that the movies are terrible. It's that they, they almost make you angry at this stage because you feel like Disney are trying to lord it over the past, that they have this morally sanctimonious perspective that we're, we're so much better now. We at Disney uh, are so much morally superior to the past. And it's offensive. It's not a word that I use often because it's, it's almost become uh, taboo among right wingers to become to be offended at anything but it's okay occasionally to get offended at something because some stuff is just genuinely offensive i find disney live action remakes offensive uh, and i think audiences are sick of them and i think that snow white lar 19 is going to absolutely bomb yeah that might be the last one of the last ones i mean it's already in production they're already marketing it zegler's out there like they have to release that one uh i think in the same way that you guys think uh the marvels has to go out i don't i don't think they can back off of that one but i think the little mermaid shook them because, you know, some of the live actions are hit and miss. Um, some make money, some don't. But, like, The Lion King made a ton of money. Aladdin made a ton of money. And I don't believe that there was anyone who had a single doubt that Little Mermaid was going to make a billion dollars. And then it made half of that. They lost, I mean, maybe $200 million or more. I think I, think I read that it was 250 to make and another 150 to market. Uh, so you know, they sunk $400 million into it. And they thought it was a, a sure thing and then it it went nowhere i mean it it crashed on the second weekend so hard and i think that shook a lot of people at disney and i think they're waking up to realize that you're you're absolutely right they're just if if the little mermaid wasn't going to do it what what exactly mean what do they have left yeah and when really you popular, when you look Hercules, at their, maybe they have a bunch of stuff in pre-production they've got this the sword in the stone the black cauldron which is a more obscure maybe from the 80s They've got Lilo and Stitch, uh, Moana. There's there's a long list. Uh, I went through them in one of my videos, but they're yeah. it's second tier stuff. Like it's yeah, they're yeah. they're basically they're done with all the first tier stuff, all the really recognizable big IPs. Snow White's yeah. the last one. That's the last really big animated movie that they're remaking, and I think it's gonna flop. And after that, it's all second tier stuff. It's stuff like Hercules and Sword in the Stone. Mm -hmm. And and who the hell has heard of Sword in the like? There, no one younger than me, I'm 34, no one younger than me is Heart of Sword in the Stone, right? I can't remember what I've seen. It. Is, is Sword in the Stone, is that the one, um, which is the one that has the, the wizard with the blue uh, the blue cap and then there's the uh, the, the witch that that's, they get? Uh, the... you're, that's the Sword in the Stone, yeah. 
Is that Sword in the Stone? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I didn't that's watch that Martin. one a couple years ago. My kids saw it on Disney Plus and they were like, what is this old movie? It's not a good movie. Uh, yeah. Like even the, the animated ver the original version, it's not great. It's it's slow. It drags. It's not a good movie. It's not going to make for a good live movie, especially when they're live movies. They're like, you know what? These movies used to be made for children. So they're like an hour long, hour and 20 minutes. What if we make them two hours and 15 minutes long? The kids are going to love that. Yeah. That'll oh, be cool. God. Uh, I mean, I, I thought well, The Little Mermaid was the worst movie of the year. And part of the reason was because it was just so mind numbingly boring. Sorry, Edward, was, what were you going to say? Extremely boring. Well, I mean, with uh, The Lion King, it's kind of culturally inert. Like, there's nothing offensive about it. It's just, it's McDonald's. It's visual McDonald's, which you just consume. It's perfectly bland. Everyone knows the tropes. And so that was going to succeed. But as soon as you bring the identity politics into it um, with uh, The Little Mermaid, then it does great with people. And if you have uh, Aquafina doing a rap and you put that into the middle of it as well, then uh, <laughs> you're on the back foot straight away. Yeah. Although even The Lion King, I, I still, um, I hear all of them because they're, they're just plagiarisms. I, I, consider, yeah. I consider this to be industrialized corporate plagiarism, mm -hmm. right? If you were a film study student and you gave a Disney live action remake as your final project, you'd be expelled for plagiarism. <laughs> So yeah. why did why did Disney get a free pass? Oh, because it's their IP. Screw them. They didn't make this. This was made by people who were working decades ago, right? Those people would get fired today for making some, you know, totally inoffensive comment about some, oh, that's a nice dress. What? Did you just comment on a woman's dress? You know, fired toxic mm -hmm. masculinity, cancel them. Um, what is that? When Aladdin came stuff? out, uh, when Aladdin came out, the, um, the, the writers and the showrunners said, uh, there's going to be a new song for the princess. It's a song about her empowerment and finding her own voice. And I knew within uh, the time it takes for light to travel one meter in less than 0 0.001 of a nanosecond that that song was going to suck. And of course they all suck. Like if it's a new, all of the new songs in the Disney live action remakes are not just bad, they're terrible. Like they are the depths of music by the way echo i've seen some of your music videos they're really good um <laughs> you, you used to do more right. of them um i i mean i, I would i guess your, your movie videos are more popular but you did a great one on uh what's her name oh god I don't to music no 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 the, the country singer uh oh um uh taylor swift I yeah video yeah, taylor, I'm, yeah i'm not a big taylor swift fan you'll be shocked to hear but that was a really good video because like all of her songs are uh one four five minor six yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, and I, the, I went through the back catalog chord sequence. yeah yeah there's like seven or eight songs of hers all using the same chord progression in the same tempo um yeah um that, that was pretty good and you did you've done some other good music videos i think although i can't remember right now but yeah all right let's let's move on to let's see pull this up here all right so we are Going to be looking ahead to the uh, stuff that's coming up. Um, so the next thing, the next big thing is Blue Beetle, which we talked a little bit about. And it, it, when I saw the trailer of that, to me, it just looks like a cross between basically Ant-Man and Spider-Man. It, 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 remind, it really reminded me of Spider-Man. I, I, I think what I'm going to do when I make a video on Blue Beetle, which I might do, I will, I'm not going to use any Blue Beetle footage. I'm just going to use Spider-Man footage because when I talk about this movie, I'm going to be saying things like the script's going to be, um, so, you know, young Miguel, I, I don't know if Miguel is actually his name. I think Miguel is his name in Cobra Kai, so I'm just going to call him Miguel. Um, young Miguel uh, s discovers these powers and uh, he's really, you know, very clumsy with them at first, but then he realizes that if he just jumps, if he just goes for it, then his powers will come out. This is just Spider. I could just use the footage from Spider Man One. I don't need That's the video awesome. footage. <laughs> um, so I'll probably just do that because it's just a rip of. It's not even a rip of a lot of movies. It looks like Ant Man meets Spider Man, and the politics as well. Like they that at the end of the trailer, the guy goes, "Batman's a fascist," <laughs> <laughs> and I've already told you that the director. Of Blue Beetle is a nobody. He's made two feature films. I, I, I said one of them doesn't have a Wikipedia page. The other one is an indie movie. He's never done anything like this, and it's all identity hiring. 
But even mm. within identity hiring, I was thinking to myself, could they not have gotten a Latino director who had some experience? Like this is this is this project is not within the capabilities of this guy who's only directed these pretentious arty political um indie movies why the hell is he at the helm of a major project like this well and what you're going to end up seeing is committee <laughs> filmmaking where mm -hmm. you know his name's going to be on it but you're going to feel the tonal differences uh between the the quiet scenes the fight scenes you know it's all it's going to feel all over the place because i guarantee this guy is not doing the whole he's not doing the whole movie you know, he they're going to bring in a bunch of other folks. They're going to have to out. use a lot of second unit directors because if you've only yeah. ever made um, very grounded indie movies, and it's really, I've, I've looked at some of his stuff, it's very boring stuff. Like one of his movies is about a black kid in a poor neighborhood who gets a bike. That, that's what the movie's about. And if that's what you're used to making, how are you going to film uh, a scene of a, a superhero flying into space? You've got no experience. You won't know the first, you literally no idea what to do. It's all, it's going to be all second unit directors. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it is going to look very all over the place. I get a feeling it's going to be a little boring uh, because, like you said, it's it's basically the same story. It's, it's Spider-Man meets Iron Man meets Ant-Man. Uh, it's 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 wacky and zany. Oh, my God, he doesn't know how to use his powers. And oh, but he has to balance his life with his family. And I don't know how they're going to fill a movie up with that. And I think there's going to be a lot of fluff in the middle. Yeah, it, it looks utterly horrendous. Have you seen the trailer for it, Echo? Yeah, I have. So, um, yeah, it's just going to be, it's not going to be a film. It's just going to be a compendium of, of tropes. He's going to have his family, his parents, he doesn't yeah. quite, uh, you know, they're, they're quite authoritative and maybe they're, they come from, uh, uh, maybe they're first generation Americans and they have very conservative and strict ideas about you should go to this college or she should do this. Mm -hmm. And he's going, no, I, I want to blaze my own trail. And there's going to be a love interest and he's going to be goofy and gawky and awkward, but he's also going to have this other power and he's not going to be able to control his power properly. And there's going to be crazy shenanigans and he's going to go through an urban landscape. <laughs> and it's going to be, whoa, I'm like Tarzan on these rugs and going through this thing and there's crazy things and it's going to be bad guys. And then there's going to be a, a lovely two thirds through the end middle sequence where he reconnects with his uh, original culture and he finds those cultural values through there and he finds through the spirit of family uh, that he's able to realize that the power was actually in him all the time. And through there, he's going to go and the hero's journey is going to complete and then it's going to be a lovely action sequence. There might even be a sky beam and then you're going to finish your popcorn and you're going to go home and then you're going to piss in the, uh, in the cinema lavatories and you're going to go home and you're going to completely forget about it. And that's that. So there, yeah, I just I saved you the whole journey to the There center. it is, right there, right on. You just saved me a ticket. Yeah. Uh, the, the bad guy is going to go, the bad guy is going to realize that he can't beat him on his own, but he can get him if he goes after his family and kidnaps him. And then he has to go and rescue his family members. And it's sad. Oh, it's going to be a lovely, uh, brilliant uh, little sidekick character who uh, is perhaps camp and perhaps uh, implied to be gay, but not quite enough that it can't uh, escape the senses in China. So that's another little thing we'll put in there as well. <laughs> You know, and, and there will be, I, I think all of the cool parts of the movie are, are already in the trailer. You're going to see the part where he, he's got the big blue glowy sword and he flips it all around and he's like, let's go. We're going for action. That looks cool. Mm. That's going to be a fun moment. And then it's going to pass and that's going to be it. Or the moment where he gets the guns on his arms and then he shoots the guys. That's going to be fun. I guarantee that's going to be a really exciting moment and it's going to last for a few seconds. And then that will be that. And then it mm -hmm. will be done. And there'll be an, an annoying little sibling who will, uh, uh, way to beat and then do a comment like so that just happened and uh, so that'd be that little character as well <laughs> gonna get some yeah, forespoken dialogue in there yeah i don't know if any of you have seen the trailer for napoleon i know you have echo you you talked a little about it but napoleon you, you kind of talked about it in a video you expressed yeah. some reservations about it what were your thoughts on it uh i don't think um what's his face is the right guy um no. he's too he's got like um a Part of his appeal is a, is a neurotic quality, whereas yeah. um, Napoleon is a, a force of nature. He's a, a powerful, uh, compelling personality. Plus, there's a height differential of probably one and a half feet between the two of them. Uh, yeah. It looks super stylized uh, with a weird kind of aesthetic that almost has like some strange uh, modern punky kind of elements that reminded me a little bit of that Marie Antoinette film from 20 years ago. Uh, I could be wrong. I also think that uh, it's going to have the Oppenheimer problem where you're trying to take the breadth and scope of a, of a whole life and try and scrunch it down into two and a half hours or three hours isn't going to work. Um, if you focus it on a 10-year patch of his life, that could work, I guess. 
Uh, I'll I'll watch it just kind of in a disengaged way because it'd be actually genuinely lovely to see these times from history created uh, in a beautiful, lush cinematography and, and beautiful landscapes with some CGI in there. So I'll probably watch it there in a kind of semi-detached kind of way. Um, so I will watch it, and there'll be a lot to enjoy about it, I'm sure. Plus, I don't yeah. the director, I still can't forgive him for those Alien remakes, which looked beautiful, but were just absolutely brain dead. So I'm wary about that as well. The, the I mean, there's a lot of historical inaccuracies in it that I, I just find really disappointing. First of all, you said Wahin Phoenix is the wrong guy, and he is. He's also too old. He yeah. The movie starts, I think, with the Siege of Toulon, which Napoleon was 24 at the time, and he was promoted to general mm -hmm. because... The majority of the French officer class were royalists and they had fled abroad to fight for the people that were trying to destroy the French Revolution. Napoleon was loyal to the revolution and he had been through the military academy in Paris and he'd done very well there. So he was able to get himself um, an officership and he was sent to Toulon and he was promoted to general after he won his victory at Toulon. And, you know, this is a young, ambitious, ambitious guy. The story is incredible. Even just the, like Napoleon's life is a great epic. It's one of the great epics of human history, but just the Toulon part is amazing because he showed up in Toulon with his family and his family had to go with him because he was the only person in his family who was earning any real money. They were broke and they were living in these really shitty rented rooms. Um, and his mother re was really relying on him, you know, to, to succeed and to, to get some money for the family. Like if Napoleon had been, for example, killed in the Battle of Toulon, which he could have been, he was wounded. The family would have fallen into poverty. So they were really relying on him. And he he was he was encouraged because he wanted this military success. And he wanted this glory, and he did want to defend the revolution. He was loyal to revolutionary France, but he also wanted to do it to support his family. You know, that alone would be an incredible movie, mm. right? Just just give us the siege of Toulon, and and you can have the the storming of the British fort at the end um, mm -hmm. as the finale. That would be amazing. But instead, they've done this wretched wikipedia page yeah, best of yeah, yeah. biopic yeah, yeah. and and yeah. you've got okay here's the toulon section and here's the egypt section mm -hmm. and, and here's the the waterloo section and the, here's austerlitz and here's 1812 when he invades russia yeah. and here's the burning of moscow and here's yeah. you know his affair with the polish uh, beautiful polish woman and and my god i just i hate those movies i hate them because they never mm. work they never work all right uh, a good recent example was Bohemian Rhapsody, where they basically, the scriptwriters just looked at Queen's Wikipedia page, wrote down, okay, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. People know about that. <laughs> yeah. Freddie Mercury got AIDS and they played, uh, they played uh, Band-Aid and uh, great, we'll, we'll uh, there we go, that's our movie. And it sucked. Yeah. And the, the same thing's yeah. going to happen with Napoleon. It will be good spectacle. Look, it's Ridley Scott, it's going to be good spectacle. But the historical inaccuracies alone are, are rotten. So, for example, the cavalry charges where the, the horses are all spaced out. That wasn't a, what a cavalry charge looked like. The cavalry was supposed to be packed tight together like a tank so that it could literally barrel through an enemy formation. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. The mm -hmm. Siege of Toulon is wrong because they blew up the British fort with a, a gunpowder barrel, I think, something like that. And then they stormed it. And in the movie, they have them using ladders. The Battle of the Pyramids takes place right next to the pyramids. It, they were 17 kilometers <laughs> from the pyramids. Right, yeah, you yeah. could see the pyramids during the battle, but they were far away, and um, and they didn't blow off the Sphinx's nose. Uh, they did well. not That's blow off the Sphinx's fallacy. nose. No, um, they seem to have Napoleon's when... character wrong as well. Um, but he's yeah, yeah Wahin Phoenix is too old. A forty-nine-year-old cannot play young Napoleon. Yep, the, you could see there was just too tempting. They wanted to do the greatest hits of all the the features of his life. Uh, it just makes me think of when. Um, they did that film Alexander, I think, in 2004, three hour long, where they tried to do the entire span, sweeping span of his life. And all the actors, um, you know, they were they were thinking this is going to be, you know, we're getting our suits ready for the Oscars. This is going to be fabulous. <laughs> it is irresistible. And then the reviews came in completely trashing it. And I think uh, this could be the same kind of thing. I think it'd be too uh, pompous and bloated and too much of a greatest hits of a life that in, in so doing will actually um, become kind of uh, inert and inane and fail to capture that grand sweep of life because it's trying to pack in that greatest hits, uh, which is too much for one film. Yeah, it, it diminishes, it ends up actually, ironically, it ends up kind of diminishing the person that they're trying to glorify. I'm already excited to watch. 
To watch Napoleon? No, to watch your video about the historical inaccuracies. Uh, I remember watching you talk about Cleopatra, and I'm already excited to watch this Napoleon video. Now, I don't, I don't know a lot about the history of it. Um, so I saw, I just saw, I watched the trailer today. It's a great looking trailer. Uh, it's cut really well. It looks exciting. If, if they try to tell a, you know, a story of of a guy who's lusting after power, like if if they basically tell the story that you, the opposite of what you hated about Barbie. Um, and are you guys hearing that? Yeah, I'm hearing that just fine, Greg. Oh, I, it's my son's on Xbox. Oh, I just want to make sure it wasn't. Anyway, um, the, uh, if, if they tell a story, if they have like a theme of the pursuit of power leads you to your own death or, or something, if they try to actually say something with the movie, even though it's going to skip over most of his life, maybe it'll work. But if they just try to do a straight up biopic, no, it's, it's you're going to cram it all in and it's just going to be jumping from thing to thing. And they're going to have to tell you what's going on. They won't be able to show you it's it, it'll, it'll fall apart. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was talking earlier about Blackberry, um, which is my favorite movie of the year. And that you, it would be very tempting. A really a, a crappy director would do that kind of thing. They would just look at Blackberry's Wikipedia page and think, okay, well, uh, let's just um, do that part and that part and that part and that part. And actually the movie split into two. So the first part of the movie is when BlackBerry were a startup company when they were formative, and then you've got that part of the movie, and then that's for, that's very funny that part of the movie. It's a lot of comedy in there, really works. And then in the second part of the movie, the second half is after they've had a lot of success, and during the success, the announcement about the iPhone comes out, sort of you know the, like the asteroid heading toward Earth kind of effect, and. We can all see it coming. The audience can see it coming. And, and we're all wondering, well, how is this train wreck going to pan out? And those are the two periods that they focus on, the formative startup period and the period when BlackBerry were at their height when the iPhone was announced and they began to fall apart because of because um, they got crushed by Apple. Those are the two periods. And that works really well because you also get to look at a dichotomy. You get to show how the characters have changed considerably. So, you know, one geek becomes kind of a shark and, and the other one stays loyal to geek culture and, and to startup culture. Uh, and that's really interesting. It, that allows you to do that when you have that contrast. And mm -hmm. you could do, if you took Napoleon, you could do that. You could do like the Siege of Toulon and then you could compare that to 1812 when he invaded Russia. And by the time he invaded Russia, he had become, you know, massively egotistical and his ambition had become overly bloated. And he was he was overestimating the abilities of his subordinates. Um, and like, he never really under overestimated his own ability. He was, you know, probably the greatest military general of all time, but he, one of the reasons he lost in Russia is because he was hiring the wrong people as his subordinates. And it's almost like he got to the point where he thought, well, I put him in charge, so he's going to succeed. Um, that's how egotistical he'd gotten and, and how bloated his, his vision and his ambition had gotten. And, and, to, to invade Russia like this gigantic landmass, um, and he also misunderstood. He miscalculated the the, the will and the determination of the Russians. Mm -hmm. So that would be really good because that would provide a brilliant contrast. Um, but yeah. unfortunately, they've, they've gone with the the standard biopic. Um, the uh, what else was I going to say? Um, if you have, if you get too much of that greater sets formula, then the, the film just becomes a series of vignettes, and um, so it kind of loses a bit of an arc like that. That's what I didn't like about Oppenheimer is that for the first third of it, it it didn't really feel like a flowing story. It felt like cinematic cells grouped together. Here's a little thing that needs to happen. Here's the key dialogue that needs to happen in the scene. Move on to the next thing. So it almost kind of disjointed in that way. I think there's a lot to be said for a film like Lincoln in 2012, where instead of doing the entirety yeah. of the of their career, you have a key moment where all the aspects of their personality and character are uh, intensified in one particular episode, where you can extrapolate from that out to the to the broad sweep of their life, and you get into the um, the nitty gritty of their character, their motivations, their drives, um, their impediments. Uh, their, their past trauma can be alluded to without being needed to be visited and, and ticked off in boxes. So by, by focusing on one particular event, you can get the, the, the broad sense of the character and the sweep of their life and their context and history as well. 
Yeah, there, there was one more movie I want to talk about that's, that's coming out. I, I had a few ideas there, but uh, we don't have time for all of them. And that was uh, Aquaman 2. And Echo, you made a very interesting video where you basically said that you think that it's immoral of DC to release this movie with Amber Heard in the movie. Uh, can you just give us your thoughts on that? Because I thought that, that was a really interesting perspective. Um, this is someone who, with court with cameras in the court every day for a, a couple of months, captured someone who was legitimately a crazy person who was who had they succeeded in their court case, would have probably not only destroyed someone uh, financially but also reputationally um, in in the form of Johnny Depp. And what she was saying was legitimately kooky and crazy and actually quite disturbing. This idea that he apparently held her down and tried to sexually assault her with a, with a bottle or something like that. Literally untrue, literally um, uh, almost sadistic in its, in its um, vitriol of wanting to destroy someone, of having narcissistic personality disorders, all of this exposed in public. And so to have someone like that on screen, it's, uh, it's so immoral and it's so hypocritical of Hollywood. And it undermines any of their um, family values, mentality, etc. If you have a literal crazy person up on the screen, like I believe very much in redemption arcs, people who go through uh, horrendous drug abuse, people who might have personal problems, uh, you know. But if they go on a redemption arc uh, and they atone and account for themselves and they come back into the cinematic industry, great, that's the immortal American second chance. But as someone who didn't account or atone for themselves, who was humiliated in public and exposed as a pathological liar uh, and attempting to do severe harm to someone, uh, then to have them up on a screen, I don't care how much money it's worth. Uh, it's immoral to me. What do you think, Greg? Uh, I, I completely agree. And I think that hopefully they're going to rethink things after The Flash, that a lot of that had to do with Ezra Miller and people did not want to see him. And I, I agree with the Echo that um, I know they're different companies, but, you know, Gina Carano was blacklisted completely, you know, because she made fun of trans people and their and their pronouns and whatever. And, and she just really didn't, you know, she was she was poking fun at people. She was being offensive and I'm not going to pretend like she did nothing. Uh, she poked the bear and they cut her off entirely. And then you have Ezra Miller going on an actual real crime spree of, of actually hurting people and destroying property. Mm. And then you've got, like you said, Amber Heard trying to destroy a man's life and lying and, and perjuring herself and all of this. And you mm -hmm. look at those two situations, and I, I understand it's Disney and Warner Brothers. They're not the same company, but it is kind of the general attitude of Hollywood that this person broke the, the PC rules and they're dead to us. And these people, they committed actual crimes, but yeah, I mean, come on, it's okay. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's... I can understand why people feel like Hollywood is evil because they treat those two situations so differently. And it is, it's very immoral. Yeah. I mean, I, I won't be going to buy a ticket for it because I, I was so hard. I mean, I was so horrified at like what Amber Heard had done to Johnny Depp, even during their marriage. Like she was talking about how she physically assaulted him. Um, she, she, you, you've got her on a recording saying things like, um, I hit you. I didn't fucking punch you. I, I was fucking hitting you. It wasn't a punch. Uh, it's it was just, just a hit. It's horrendous mm. stuff. Like, mm -hmm. um, and like, like, um, you know, putting him down when he's, uh, you know, in a state of horrible depression and things like that. Just, just really, really sadistic stuff. So I, I will just tell on moral principle, I'm not paying to see that movie. I may acquire other means of watching it, which I'll not talk about on, you know, but, um, there's no way I'm yeah. paying to see that movie. There's no way. Um, and I'd say, I think a lot of people feel the same way. They just, they're so disgusted by Amber Heard because let's not forget, like Amber Heard was at one point the most unpopular woman on the planet. And they're just not going to show up to a movie theater to see her because despite, it, it's going to be hard for Hollywood to grasp this. But there are a lot of people out there for whom morality and doing the right thing actually matters. It doesn't, it's inconceivable to them. Right, the idea that you would have a moral compass because they're Hollywood, but most people do, and I, I think too many people would just be turned off by the idea of, of going to see her in a theater. One yeah. thing I will say though, and this is a really interesting, this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. So when they release the trailer for Aquaman two, if they have Amber Heard in it, uh, P 
people are going to get angry about that and, and they're not going to show up because they can see that she's in the movie and like, nope, not going to see it, right? And they're going to, you know, the the backlash is going to start as soon as the trailer comes out because she's, she's in the trailer. If she's not in the trailer, they're going to accuse them, uh, uh, DC are going to be accused of trying to hide it, right? So the right wing are going to mm-hmm. accuse them. You're trying to hide the fact that you've made this this movie with Amber Heard. And then the left wing are going to be angry at them by saying, you know, you're not supporting women. You, you've gone with the whole mainstream narrative that uh, that she was the abuser and Johnny Depp had nothing to do with it when really they were both abusive to each other because that's the left wing narrative. So they're screwed either way. Like they yeah. are, like when it comes to the trailer, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, it's just so absurd that in the modern world, uh, a superhero film about a fish man ends up with all this ridiculous <laughs> identity politics and bullshit and, and court crap and reshoots. God, how can you fuck up something so fundamental and simple? God damn it. You know, I think uh, that speaks to a larger issue, though, that they they intertwined the personalities of the actors and, and the politics. And they made it very personal, whereas I do think you, you bring up a good point that in the past, when Hollywood and reality were kind of separate, actors did bad things, and we even knew they did bad things, but movies were just a different place. Like, it was a separate reality entirely because it, it just it was, it was separate. They didn't talk about current day politics. They didn't try to make current day um, statements on things. And so even if you knew an actor was a bad person in real life, it didn't really affect you in the same way of going to see the movie because that's not even the same person. That's a character. I don't even know that person. I'm just seeing a movie. And now, like, I don't want to see Hunger Games because I think Rachel Zegler sucks. And I don't want to look at her on screen because I know what I know about her. And they're too connected now. Yeah. Um, uh, briefly, I, I don't also don't like... Just... Uh... Go, go ahead, Echo. Uh, um. I um, also don't like the idea of the auteur gets a cultural pass. So if you're Polanski and you never quite attributed or accounted for the crazy, horrible stuff that you did, you get a pass because you're a genius and you're a separate category. If you're Woody Allen, there's a lot of dubious, morbid shit going on there, but you're a genius, so you get a pass. So I don't like that either. Yeah, Foucault as well, the the French postmodernist. Like, have you heard mm. about what he did in um, in North Africa? And I think it was Algeria. Oh, yeah. Like I, I, it's, and, uh... I, I can't even say it on this stream because I might get a strike by <laughs> from YouTube. I'm not even kidding. If I were to describe to you what he physically did, I would be in danger mm-hmm. of getting a strike. Like, just go yeah. look it up. It is fucking horrifying. But I mean, um, the left today still, you know, he's still their guy. They love Foucault. I've heard his philosophical ideas. I don't even care what he did. He's an idiot. I don't even i I don't care about his personal stuff. His his ideas alone are enough for me to hate that guy yeah mm. his ideas are ratchet i will say that what he did in algeria involved very young children so wow. yeah. you know like him and, uh, and, wrong wild. andre gide and uh and oscar wilde and, and bosi they're all into that uh, 13 and 14 year olds in algeria and egypt yeah um i think foucault he had one of the bars he frequented had um uh they would uh, have pipes going from the urinals and they would spray the dance floor with urine from uh, from the urinals. That was one thing they're into. And then some people, they got on such a crazy uh, drug binges that they would like uh, try and break open the pipes so they could douse themselves in urine. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Those are Foucault's uh, favorite haunts. Mm. Uh, the last topic I wanted to touch on um, was Secret Invasion. Now, uh, I, I, I've seen the first two episodes and I just couldn't take anymore. It, it was so all-encompassingly boring. I was with you. I quit after two. <laughs> I, just couldn't, I couldn't keep... I didn't, I didn't even want to make videos. It was so bad. Um, Echo, have you subjected yourself to any of Secret Invasion? No, I've seen so many other YouTubers have just... Uh, with this mentality of exhaustion, uh, kind of a weird kind of subdued despair, uh, incredulity, misery... And so I thought, uh, you know, they've taken that, uh, they've taken that um, for the team and for me. So, no, I'm not going to watch this because there was absolutely. I would just look for any angle where I could think, well, there might be some interesting aspect to this I could look into. Maybe as a, as a showcase for poor writing. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very much a showcase yeah. for poor writing, and I, I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't make notes. Usually, when I when I review something, I watch it twice. I watch it once just to watch it and get my general ideas, and then I watch it and I take notes and I think think a bit more about it. Um. 
I only watched it once and I was noticing immediately like basic writing mistakes. And I'll, I'll give one example. There was a torture scene in which a woman is torturing a man who is actually a scroll, but it doesn't work at all. It's very ineffective. This is an episode two. And the reason it's ineffective is because in order for a torture scene to work, I need to know what the motivations of the characters are. I need to know what does the torturer want? Um, why does the torturer want this? And who is being tortured? And, and what is uh, what is his or her motivation? You know, is this someone who's likely to crack? Is this someone who is um, in danger of giving up very important information? And we didn't know any of this because from the perspective of the show, everything had to be a mystery. Right, everything yeah. had to be mysterious and everything had to be a secret. It's the secret invasion, so everything's a secret. So there's this torture scene. You don't know who these people are. I don't know who's the good guy or who's the bad guy. I don't know what either of them wants. I don't know what the point of any of this is. So it's just boring. It's just just boring. It bored the hell out of me. A torture scene, which is supposed to be very nail biting and engaging and dramatic, it bored me to death because it was so poorly written. The prerequisites that you have to include to make a torture scene work were not there. Yeah. And that's just one example. There are dozens of of bad writing examples in this show. It it was it was it was extremely boring. And I was I went into it optimistic, and so I was especially let down because I thought, okay, we're gonna get you know after after Ant Man, after Thor, um, you know, we're gonna get something serious. We're gonna get an adult show. We're gonna get some Jason Bourne spy thriller action. You know, some tension. And I got a lot of long staring. I got a lot of walking around. I got a lot of, like you said, I, I didn't even know who that guy was in the torture scene. And then they kill him later. They kill him, you know, five minutes later. So he's not even important. I don't know what information he gave up. Um, I didn't really think about that as to why I didn't care about that scene. And now I realize that's, yeah, that's why I didn't, I didn't, didn't know who they were. I just know he was there and they were racing against the clock because Gravik was going to come rescue him. And that's, that's all you know. And yeah, two episodes. I gave them two hours thinking we should go somewhere. And we all, all I learned was that Nick Fury is old and slow and he sucks. That's all I really learned in that two hours. Yeah. And the other thing that I noticed was that a lot of it is just people in rooms talking, having boring conversations and repetitive conversations. And I couldn't even listen half the time. My mind just wanders off uh, at these utterly inane, repetitive, dull boring conversations in boring rooms with boring characters. And there's a lot of that. I was, I was wondering actually, how did this cost $300 million? I could have made this for a thousand dollars because it's yeah, just really people not a sitting lot in of, rooms talking. Not a lot of CGI. Uh, most of the, the scroll stuff, they really didn't even, they weren't in scroll form much. So I know that's makeup, but it really, it's not like super heavy. It's, it's literally just face and ears. Like they didn't do a whole body suit or any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I don't know where the money went at this point. I'm, I'm buying into the laundering conspiracy theories because I don't know where the $200 million went for a show that was just live actors in rooms, like you said. Yeah, and it's, I mean, in case anyone's wondering, the thing absolutely bombed. And I mean bombed. I've never heard of a show on Disney Plus doing this badly. It Its debut didn't even hit a million. To put that into perspective, Willow did better than that. Fucking Willow. <laughs> Willow has been scrubbed from Disney Plus because it was worth more to Disney as a tax write-off because nobody was watching it. Secret Invasion got less than that. So that's that's where you know Marvel is right now. Yeah. Miss Marvel, I think, had uh three quarters of a million. So uh yeah, Secret Invasion is just above Ms. Marvel in viewership. But I that's don't understand how it could horrendous. fail because uh they had such a winning, obviously winning template to work with. People loved the idea of beloved legacy character um, Luke Skywalker being trashed and turned into a boring, tedious, uh, self-hating <laughs> old man. And people loved Indiana Jones as a craggy old man who's displaced in his own film by someone else. So following on from that formula, logically, obviously, people would want nothing more than to see Nick Fury as a, a haunted and, uh, and bored and tired old man. So how could that formula not work? Your guess is as good as mine. It was, it was, a, it was a hole in one. It was a sure thing. <laughs> Do you think they tried to think uh, they Marvel thought, well, uh, Andor kind of worked as a kind of grounded, gritty, serious kind of thing in the Star Wars uh, universe. So maybe if we try something kind of Andorish over here, then maybe that'll work. I don't know. But I mean, Andor had world building. Um, yeah, it, it actually, and, and it moved around 
quite a lot. It was quite a it was quite a lot of movement. It felt somewhat flexible, but and and the production design was really good in Andor, but the um, and it also had something that was at least identifiable as a story. But in Secret Invasion, there is no production design to speak of. It's just a bunch of people standing around in rooms, and mm-hmm. it doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't really have a story. It has a it has a premise, mm-hmm. which is that the scrolls are um forming a kind of secret army to to have a a revolution in which they will take over the earth that's the premise but the premise never develops into a story not at least at least not in the two episodes that i saw it sounds like a botched reimagining of that show v you got like the green yeah yeah i remember v v i thought was okay that was that was kind of campy and fun um although i i I didn't finish the first season but it was all right it was a hell of a lot better than secret invasion Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, that's actually what I was thinking of. It's like a really shitty version of V made by film study students because they couldn't afford, you know, anything better. So with the, the thing with Secret Invasion is I, I feel like it it really points out that Marvel in its current uh, in its current form, it I don't know if I, my personal theory, I think they need to do a full reset. I just I think they need to start over. It's I think they have power creep and they've got plot creep at this point um echo i don't know if you've seen any of the i watched reviews of the final episode just to kind of stay abreast of what was going on and at the end mm-hmm. amelia clark uh they had been collect nick fury had been collecting dna from superheroes apparently that were at the battle of, of endgame even though she uses some powers for heroes that weren't there but whatever who cares about continuity um and he's collecting all this dna and then the scrolls have a machine that gives them the powers because of the DNA. It's apparently not explained very well, but the end of the show uh, supposedly has the villain Gravik and then Amelia Clark fighting, and they're like using every. It, it was the, uh, the review I watched described it as like kids playing that were like, "I've got a strong Drax arm." Okay, well I've got mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Genetic <laughs> powers. Okay, well I have Miss Marvel yeah, powers. Yeah. Okay, well you know what I have fire powers, and like they keep <laughs> one upping each other. And they're using yeah. every power that you've seen in the last 15 years. And mm-hmm. now Amelia Clark's character, literally an objective statement, is the most powerful character in the entire... She has every power. She's got the 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 psychic abilities of the, the Black Maw, which I guess is supposed to be one of the most powerful telekinetics in the, in the universe. She's got Captain Marvel's powers. She's got the Hulk. She's indestructible like the Hulk. So at this point, they have... They've written themselves into a corner where they want Miss Marvel to be the most powerful thing in the universe. They've got Gaia, uh, Amelia Clark's character, that is now literally the most powerful. Um, they've spread the story out across the entire galaxy. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, they brought in all the Eternals. Right now, a lot of people keep reminding us that there is the body of a celestial sticking out of Earth in, in the MCU. <laughs> that yeah. nobody, they're just like, nah, we're just not going to talk about that anymore. So I think that they seriously need to consider just doing like a, I don't know, like a, like a flashpoint esque thing or whatever. Like they need to find a way to wrap it up and reboot because not only have they just spread it out too much, but even the audience at this point, you like, like before I watched uh secret invasion, cause I, I watched the trailer and I was like, did I miss something? What's I didn't even know what was going on in the show. And I found a recap by a uh, screen crush and it was a 20 minute long video giving me all and he was moving quick too and he was like then this happened then this he covered like the whole history of the mcu that involved fury and ben mendelson's character talos and like how we got to that point and i thought if i have to watch a 20 22 minute recap to understand and that was like quick fire there's just they've spread out too thin it's it's just you know before it was the six avenger characters and almost everything happened on earth and i think they've just spread out too much and they need to bring it back in and i don't know how they do that short of just saying okay whatever kang won or they defeat kang but in the process the multiverse collapses and now it's only one and we forget the multiverse ever happened and oh it's now x-men and the avengers never happened and we're just going to start over completely yeah it's uh it's it's there's so much power and so much scope that nothing means anything. So there's no stakes because multiverses can reset everything, or maybe there aren't even multiverses anymore. <laughs> so yeah, yeah nothing means it, you're exactly right. It's, it's the psychology of children at play where it's just pure insane escalation of powers and, and doubling up of powers. 
but at least with children's play, um, you know, your mom calls you to dinner, so you put your action figures down and then go have dinner and you come back and everything's reset and back to normal again. But with MCU, <laughs> you, you don't have that option. It's just everything is canonical, even though things aren't canonical because of multiverses and everything else. So it's just one huge candy colored mess. Yeah, when you, when you were comparing the Blue Beetle to the Blue Beetle to Spider Man, there, if you go back and look at the first Spider Man movie with Tobey Maguire, his the the scope of it is that you've got the Green Goblin who basically wants to become more powerful and establish uh, kind of many villains empire within New York, basically, and he also wants to I mean to achieve dictatorial control over his company, and th those are his goals, right? And Spider-Man's goal is to prevent the Green Goblin from forming this kind of villain syndicate. This, this, this to prevent him from doing bad stuff and starting his bad guy organization. He tries to bring Spider-Man in on it and says, "You know, if we work together, we could, we could create so much. We could, uh, or we could destroy so much." And Spider-Man wants to prevent this from happening. So the stakes are um, they're small scale. They don't go outside of the scope of New York City, right? But with the blue beetle like i think at some point in the trailer they say something like you know he doesn't just threaten us he threatens the entire world so it's world ending stakes you have a superhero who's just beginning on his journey he has no experience mm -hmm. he doesn't even know how to use his powers and yet he's expected to take on a a literal existential threat a threat that is going to end all of humanity potentially and it's just so fucking dumb uh, yeah, you do need to shrink the, the stakes down and, and to make them more personable so that people can connect with them emotionally. Because you, you can't yeah. connect with, like the multiverse is a really fascinating psychological uh, study because you were talking earlier, Echo, about uh, character archetypes and fairy tales. And you, you connect with those really well on an emotional level. I think audiences, they don't seem to connect very well with the multiverse because there's nothing in our psychology. There's no frame of reference for it. There's nothing yeah, right. deep in our biology for it. It, it All yeah. it does is take us outside of our frame of reference, at which point we lose all emotional connection to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a question for you guys. You know how China, there's often this tension when it comes to uh, black actors or black films, and they often change the posters in China. So like Wakanda they'll de-emphasize the blackness or um uh, what was another film uh, like in star wars the posters they took um the black character and they minimized him in the poster with blue beetle we, we've got something i think we've never seen before which is how are chinese going to pe people going to react to a, a latino themed film do you think it's going to have problems in china for that reason interesting i haven't thought about it yeah, I hadn't either. That's a very good question. I, I think that actor is, he's a light-skinned kind of guy. So maybe that maybe that did factor into their decision-making because China's a huge market. And mm. maybe they kind of wanted him because, you know, he he's, you know, clearly they're going to emphasize the Latino family aspects of it. And they're like, they're they're really pushing that in there. But he himself you know, yeah, he looks like a Latino guy, but he maybe looks like a really tan white guy. Like maybe mm -hmm. they're banking on him being close enough to white that the Chinese are just going to roll with it. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but guys, I don't want to keep you too long. I, you've given me a great deal of your time. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the stream. Thanks for your time. And um, yeah, look, really enjoyed speaking with you. Hey, you too, man. It's been great. All right. So, yeah. And thank you for everyone who stuck with us throughout the chat. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. It's some good. Right. Absolutely. Time in there. Yeah, right, enjoy your, you, yeah, Greg, enjoy your evening and Echo, enjoy your day. <laughs> <laughs> cool. We'll do. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. See you very much. Bye. Um, okay. I'll do a quick cut. I'll, I'll do a quick catch up with the chat i haven't been able to engage with the chat throughout the course of this so i will uh i'll just be just be chatting with you so let's have a look here so um i got a, a five dollars from a free state and he says a problem with historical black heroes is that they will never ruin them like they will ruin them like in chevalier yeah chevalier was a movie about a french violinist in, in a french court in the 18th to the 17th century or something i think it was the 18th century 
And the goal of the movie was basically to teach French people how, you know, France has always been diverse and uh, and there have always been black people in France. Basically, it's one of those movies. The BBC do it all the time when they're making movies, especially now with Dickens adaptations. They'll, they'll do this a lot. They'll have like a lot of black characters just here and there around London, which is anachronistic and, and historically inaccurate. But it's done to convince the people in those countries that, no, no, you've always been diverse and... and, and uh, there's no such thing as a native French person or a native English person. Um, now, I didn't see Chevalier. I heard that it was shite, uh, so it didn't bother watching it. It was also quite obscure. But historical black heroes, like the guy himself, Chevalier, may have been very good, but I don't think that's what their emphasis was. I think their emphasis was just um, diversity, basically. Um, do they, you know, as for ruining historical black heroes, I don't think they're interested. Like Hollywood have no interest in historical black figures because it's not IP. Plain and simple. I mentioned at the start of this stream an idea of having a civil war story told from the perspective of slaves who are following Sherman's army. You would never get that because it's going to be, it would be a very expensive production and it's not proven IP. They don't give a shit about genuine black stories or, or telling different stories from the, the perspective of different people throughout history and different cultures. They just, they want to virtue signal how, how uh, dedicated they are to the ideals of of diversity and so forth. So no, uh, you're right. hundred percent. If, if there are any genuine black heroes in history, Hollywood have no interest in them. Uh, let's take a look. So I'll, I'll just go back to the chat here. Um, starting with the most recent. I'm drunk, but hey, Despot, your review of why Rings of Power is so shit was absolutely bloody brilliant. I tip my hat to you, sir. Says Lauren Madigan. Thank you very much. Yes, Rings of Power was something else. That was a, a cultural moment. My God, that show. Uh, that was one of the most difficult shows for me to watch from start to finish, I think. And I've, uh, one episode took me two or three sittings. They're an hour long, but my God, they, they felt like they were three hours long each. That show is just awful. It's everything that's wrong with Hollywood and streaming series today. 20 years from now, you will be able to watch Rings of Power to identify all of the problems that uh, modern Hollywood today, like woke Hollywood has. You'll be able to look at that and say, okay, that's that's what the woke era was. Okay, now I get it. Um, you won't enjoy it, but it will be interesting from a historical cultural perspective. Melvin Deeply says, the multiverses are very badly done and often contradictory. Rick and Morty did it better than Marvel or DC. They need to be clever, but they're not. I never watched Rick and Morty. I, I, the last adult cartoon that I watched was probably Futurama way back in the day. And then I just kind of never really bothered with it again. Um, I've I've heard good things about Rick and Morty. I, I might check it out, but I, I've i have I seen a multiverse that's been done well? God, it's a good question. I mean, it was done well in the, in leading up to Thanos. Uh, there was, there was some minor use of it, especially in the last movie in, in uh, Endgame when they actually finally defeat Thanos. But once you go past the, once it, it gets upscaled, it, maybe the multiverse can work on a very, very small scale, but once it gets upscaled, it just falls apart. Even in the flash, there's a scene in the flash where Michael Keaton is trying to explain the multiverse to the two Ezra Miller, the two Ezra Millers. And he takes a bowl of cooked spaghetti and he just throws it on the plate. And he says, yeah, that's the multiverse. It's just a big, spaghetti mess and it's almost like the movie was admitting to the fact that the multiverse barely even makes sense and it's just an absolute mess it, it was a very self-aware moment where the writers just said look this thing's a mess everyone knows it's a mess let's just own up to it in the movie let's just let's just point to the elephant in the room so yeah i think i, I would be quite happy to see the multiverse just scrapped as a dramatic plot mechanic i don't think it works very well anymore uh, Jason Pritchard says, exactly, old school Spider-Man was good, written, and uh, brilliant, unbelievable. Yeah, excellent writing, great casting as well. Uh, Kirsten Dunst was was perfect as MJ. I do like uh, Zendaya as MJ, even though it's it's kind of race-swapped, but at the same time, it's taking part in a different universe, so it's, it's a different MJ. They still have the white MJ in the other universe. That's kind of the mechanic they went with. But I didn't, I didn't care that much. I thought she was quite a good MJ. Um, and yeah, the, the, but not, that's my favorite superhero trilogy. The, 
Tobey Maguire trilogy. Some people do dump on the third movie, and, and there are problems with the third movie. For example, the sand, the character of the Sandman isn't fully realized in it. But I mean, that thing has Billy Maguire in it, and it doesn't get much better than Billy Maguire. That that's just legend level stuff. But one and two in particular are excellent in that trilogy. Uh, and Le Monde 2007 says they've replaced or are in the process of replacing every Avenger with a woman. That's true, yeah. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I've, I've just talked about how Secret Invasion was an absolute bomb. Uh, Ant-Man 3 was a flop. I think the Marvels is going to be an absolute disaster. Everybody does. And the Gu Guardians was the only success that they've had this year. So Marvel are in, things are going absolutely terrible for them. And at one point, they are just going to have to reboot because they can only eat so many of these failures. Hopefully, when they reboot, they won't do it with the whole guard power nonsense. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, right, Melvin deeply says, the end of The Flash fucked the franchise. It ended with Clooney as Batman. Had the film been a hit, they would have had to write their way out of that mess. Oh God, it is a mess. Why does George Clooney just randomly show up as Batman? Obviously, the idea is that the Flash has changed history just enough so that Batman is now George Clooney from the you know the horrible cheesy '90s movies where they had like bat nipples on the bat armor. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what though. I bet that Batman Returns or Batman Forever. I can't even remember the name of those George Clooney movies. They're, they're probably better than the flash i will say that i'm gonna have to watch those movies again uh, arnold schwarzenegger was in one of them as mr freeze or mr frost whatever his name is and he was really campy i'm not not gonna go out on a limb and say he was good but he was certainly interesting i would like to do a video on that movie like just to, to test out like was it actually that bad or are we remembering it wrong maybe it was good i don't know i think uma thurman was in one of those two as Uma Thurman wasn't one. She played uh, Poison Ivy. She was very campy also. She looked hot, though. Um, all right. And Director admitted they were still finding the story when editing the last episode. Lol says, Guy Gadbois. I think you're referring to um, Secret Invasion. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't watch the last episode, and the, if it did have a story, I didn't know. I didn't notice it. It did have a premise. Like I said, the premise never emerged into a story. I'll just go to the most recent, most recent comments here. So let's have a look. Val Kilmer was in Batman Forever. God, I don't remember Val Kilmer in that. Um, I can't because I watched it so long ago that I can't even remember seeing him in it. Um, Jimmy John says, "Not a movie related question, but what do you predict for Starfield?" Is it another F076 or will the promises actually be fulfilled? I don't know what that is. Sorry. Uh, uh, is it a video game? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Batman and Robin really was that bad. Was it? Was it? Uh, like, I'd love to do a video on it. And the video, that would be the premise of the video. Was it really that bad? Um, I just haven't, I haven't had time to make one of those videos yet. I've been meaning to do a video series called Was It That Bad? And look back at these movies, mostly from the 90s. But there's been so much garbage from Hollywood that I haven't really had the time for it because when I do make one of these videos I know that it's not going to get that many views because it's not a current topic but I would like to do it I think it'll be fun uh let's see Barbie being such a success is the end of any hope for Hollywood well I never I never had any hope for Hollywood some people have this mistaken idea that Hollywood is going to de wokeify that they're going to become less politicized because all of the woke stuff is failing and that moving forward, they will just get back to making, you know, normal good movies like they used to do in the 90s. That is never, never going to happen. They might change, the, the, they may put the mask back on so that the political messaging becomes more subtle, but they're never going to fundamentally change uh, the, the, the ideological framework of their productions. So, for example, I was talking about Blackberry. Now, Blackberry is a movie that it's all men, and there's one very, very, very minor female character in it. I think she's a secretary. That movie could not get made in Hollywood. That's an indie movie. You couldn't do it in Hollywood because you would have a room full of just soy-drinking pussies. 
and and, and women saying, oh, no, no, we can't do this. They're like, they, what, what, you want to take us back to the 1950s? There's nothing but men in this. And of course, they also have to change the movie to make so that it, it, it's eligible for awards. The Oscars now have um, race quotas and diversity quotas. And if your movie isn't, and they're very, very nebulous, but if your movie does not have the minority groups as they are defined by the Academy, it is not eligible for awards. So for example, Blackberry would not be eligible for best Oscar, even though it deserves best Oscar because it's the best movie of 2023 so far. It should, it would certainly deserve a nomination, but it won't get one because it's all men. Um, and there's no black people in it. That's another problem. That's, that's another reason like Hollywood wouldn't make a movie like that. And it's almost all white men as well. So that wouldn't be eligible. Now that's, that, that's now entrenched in Hollywood. So the idea that they're going to move beyond, that we're going to have the woke era, woke era and then things will normalize again, it's just not going to happen. Like I say, you, they may put the mask back on, things might change, but it's never fundamentally going to go back to the way it was. Um, Jack Meeks says, hey, Despot, just wanted to say, can't wait for 2023 woke awards. I need more Karen Alpha. Uh, Karen iPhone. Yeah, yeah, she. I've got a, I've got some really funny jokes already written for it, and I've I've written some of the you know I've sketched out the the basic script. It's going to be a good one, and it's really really stacked. Like there's so much competition for the 2024 book book awards. It's going to be great. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. looking forward to the script, and and I'm also interested to see how how the subs are going to vote. Like what where the what 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 way is it going to go? Like for example, when Velma came out, I thought okay, Velma chewing it's going to sweep the awards and then queen cleopatra came out so what's what's going to win what's going to win worst series velma or queen cleopatra it's probably going to be one of those two but i mean man it's 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 exciting stuff i care a lot more about that than i do about the oscars i don't give a shit about the oscars but i'm excited for the worst of woke awards um i would say it's probably the same with most of my subscribers if not all of them um okay any thoughts on Terminator Salvation? I've decided it's not that bad in light of recent Terminator films. When I last saw Terminator Salvation, it's been a while since I've watched it, so I can't remember it that well. But when I did last watch it, I enjoyed it. I think it's a pretty good movie, and it's a very good attempt to bring to life the what what we all wanted to see when we watched the first movie, especially. We saw these kind of th these images from the future, these scenes from the future of the Terminator War. And we all wanted to see that movie. That would have been really cool. So I kind of wanted to see that. Um, and, and they did a fairly good job of it. Terminator Salvation is not that bad at all. That's quite a decent film. I would say it's about the same level as Terminator 3. Terminator 3 is pretty good. Um, when you when you watch it, especially when you compare it with the shit that they're coming out with today. And yeah, Terminator Salvation, solid movie. I'd need to watch it again. It has been a while. So, But I do remember enjoying it last time I watched it. Interestingly, the last two Terminator movies, Terminator Dark Fate, which was the last one, and the previous one, Terminator Genesis, I realized they both make the exact same mistake. The fundamental problem they make is that the Terminator isn't really able to carry out its role of being a protector because the characters are overpowered. So in the in Terminator Genesis, uh, Sarah Connor is now guard boss and she literally kills two Terminators in the first 30 minutes, I think, or, or the, at least the first act. She kills two Terminators. And when you have this little woman running around and she can kill two Terminators, well, what does she even need the protector Terminator for? Why does she need the T-800 to, to protect her? Like, what, what is he actually protecting? We never get the sense that she's seriously imperiled and that she needs the Terminator to protect her. He's just there. She, he's just a tool that she is using. She doesn't She doesn't absolutely need him. She can clearly take care of herself. And you've also got Kyle Reese, who's also quite a, he's an experienced soldier. He can protect her too. So there's no, there's no damsels, right? Nobody is in danger. In Terminator 1, it was Sarah Connor. In Terminator 2, it was uh, John Connor as a young boy. He was kind of the damsel. He he had to be protected by the Terminator and by his mother. And his mother wasn't this overpowered Mary Sue. And the Terminator had to protect both of them. So it made sense. You got the same thing in, in T3. In Terminator 3, the Terminator was protecting John Connor and his girlfriend because John Connor was he was a, a wimpy drug addict, basically. And he had the he, he, this girl started 
hanging around with him. And he and the Terminator had to protect both of them. So that's why it worked. But then in the last two movies, that all went out the window. Every all the women were guard bosses. Even grandma Sarah Connor was a girl was a girl boss grandma. It, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And when you you lose that dynamic of the Terminator protecting the weak, you lose one of the fundamental, most important elements of the movie. And that's why those last two movies were so it's one of the many reasons they were so shite. Uh, let's see. Are you looking forward to Martin Scorsese's next movie, Killers of the Flower Moon? Yeah, I'm definitely going to see that one. I've got that on, I've actually got that on my calendar. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't know much about it, but I kind of like that. I, I want to go in kind of not knowing much about the movie and, and just get as fresh a perspective on it as I can. Uh, looking forward to that one. Walter Uber, is there a Velma second season? Yeah, it was. it's coming, yeah. So they will be making a Velma season two. It was greenlit because Velma season one was just so spectacularly successful and so well liked that Warner Brothers decided we needed another one. Uh, yeah, Warner Brothers. I mean, Warner Brothers are, uh, they're going to be up for worse company at the Woke Awards this year as well, next year as well, because they did the fake Barbie marketing campaign. They made Barbie and they've, they've greenlit Velma season two and they did Velma. So they have committed some horrendous crimes, Warner Brothers. And that's to say nothing of the flash. Like my God, the flash was, fucking terrible all right black cleopatra was malicious to actually to actual historical figures velma just bastardized fictional characters black cleopatra will win says Lamont 2007 i would oh i i which who's the see this is the interesting thing i honestly don't know who's the favorite that's you're correct i think that queen cleopatra is worse but at the same time like velma is a disgusting show like it is really just immoral depraved horrible shit so I'm I'm genuinely curious to know which one is, is going to win. And also the emotions have cooled on both of them. So by the time the voting starts, the emotions have cooled down and people are going to be able to look at it from a more objective perspective. Uh, also bear in mind, as much as Cleopatra was a big internet sensation on YouTube and, and, and the backlash against it was massive, nobody watched it. <laughs> nobody watched it. So... Whereas, you know, some people did watch like one or two episodes of Velma and then thought, what the fuck is this? I am out of here. So we'll see what happens with that. It's an interesting, it's it's, it's really a two horse race with that one. Um, regarding Velma, Billy Bada says, no death spot of Antrim, it was already made. I think that it was in production. I know that season two of Elmo was in production by the time they released season one. I think it might have been in post-production. But even then, even if it was already made, you, there, you could still make a case for canceling it because, and this, is, this has happened before, whereby a, a season of television is in production when the TV show gets canceled because they don't want the marketing costs and they feel that finishing the production and marketing the production is simply going to be too expensive given how much of a failure it is. And that's certainly the case with Velma. They could easily have canceled season two because season two was a huge flop. There was a massive backlash against it. It, it was actually damaging to HBO's public image to have a show that bad and that spiteful on their platform. So they could definitely have canceled it. Um, I was slightly surprised that they didn't, but I guess that Mindy Keeling, she's just a little bit too diverse to cancel her show after one season. She she has that diversity armor. So that protected her from cancellation. If that had been a show by like a bunch of white guys, it would have been canned after the first episode. They would have announced the cancellation. Um, I got into, so it's just about time, says, I got into a verbal debate with a guy over Barbie. He contended that there was no male hating in it. I was like, the fuck? But I didn't have an hour to explain it. How does one sum up that crap? How does one sum up the man hating it? The fundamental premise of Barbie is that it's good for women to have power, but it is bad when men have power. And that the patriarchy, or what it describes as the patriarchy, is self-evidently bad. So men having any position of power is bad and is to be criticized. And men can only have power if women are present. So for example, she says that the Mattel board, she's angry, not angry, she's surprised and almost shocked that there are no women on the Mattel board. And the implication there is that if if men are allowed to have power, it is only acceptable if they are having it 
it, while women are present, like they're sharing it with women. Basically, Barbie as, as a movie, it's founded on that premise. It's founded on the premise that women should have power and that power is a good thing. And also the idea that women should be allowed to inv invade men's spaces. So th there was a time when business, boardrooms, uh, gyms and, and places like that were men's spaces. And men's spaces have been completely invaded by women over the past 50 years. And there are no men's spaces left anymore. It doesn't matter where you go. There's always going to be women there. You could rise to the highest echelons of the corporation. There's going to be lots of women there. And, and it is important. There used to be men's clubs as well. There used to be men's clubs. And these are all gone now. And I think it's important for men to have their own spaces and for women to have their own spaces because we are different and we need our own spaces to to network and in the case of men to to develop a strong masculine network of men with whom you can work together to to succeed and to attain good things in life and things that you need and also to, to just be with your bros it's okay if you just want to be with your bros you don't want to be around women you just want to hang out with your bros that's fine but movies like barbie they suggest that anytime men just want to be on their own and, and, and chill out in their own space no we can't have that Every male space needs to be invaded by women. Uh, and that's, I, I just, I completely disagree with that. And I, I also would disagree with the opposite. I think women should have their own spaces and men should stay the hell out. So um, stuff like Barbie, I can't stand because it just pushes this idea that women need to be everywhere all the time. And it's just not true. And I hate it. Yeah, that's what I would say about it. I mean, I know that's a little bit long-winded, but Barbie is such an absolute mess of a movie that you do need to kind of give a long-winded answer when you're trying to explain why it is so man-hating and, and why it is so feminist and the various things that are wrong with it. Um, okay, so let's have a look at uh, Evan Dubiel says, my vote is for Mandalorian Season 3 for worst because, mostly because of... I expectations possibly i mean i don't think that it will it'll definitely get nominated it's an absolutely wretched season of television will it get nominated yes will it win probably not i would say i would say velma is going to beat it out now that said i would rather watch velma again than watch mandalorian season three again because velma is at least short and the animation is fine right it, it's okay to look at but Mandalorian season three, and also you can hate watch Velma. There's so much politics in it, like literally every few seconds. If if this if there hasn't been an anti white male joke in a minute, guarantee it's coming within the next minute. So you can kind of hate watch Velma from that perspective. But the Mandalorian season three is just so mind numbingly boring. It is a, an astoundingly boring show. So I I don't even know which way I'm going to vote. I'm I, I could vote Mando season three, but. I'll probably have to give it to Cleopatra. Like, I'll vote for Cleopatra because I was just so appalled at what they did, and, and, and it was so disgusting this assault on history. But I could, I there's a great, great case to be made for Mandalorian season three. Absolutely, it will be interesting to see if they stick to the same formula for Velma season two. I don't think they would do rewrites because rewrites would just be too expensive. You would have to redo the animation. With animation, when you're making the second season, you reuse a lot of the same backgrounds, and that makes it cheaper. And also, you, you're reusing a lot of the same character animations. So you can make a second season of an animation show very cheaply, but if they rewrite it, then it would become expensive. So they weren't, they're not going to rewrite it. Velma Season 2 will almost certainly be the same drag that Velma Season 1 was. And because people are aware of how bad it is, I think the backlash will be extremely intense because the attitude will be, well, you knew how bad this was. You knew how people felt about it. And you you delivered the exact same product again. You got the same show that makes fun of teenage boys' genitals. You've got the same show that massively over-sexualizes teenagers, and which is extremely viciously anti-male and very specifically anti-white male. So the backlash for season two will be as bad, if not worse, than the backlash for season one. But it's going to be the same shite. Right. Coppola is still alive and working on a new film, says Joseph Perry. As far as I'm aware, Coppola actually funded that movie himself. He, I think he sold his wineries. He had some wineries in California, and he was able to fund the movie by selling the wineries because he couldn't get Hollywood to fund it. So this is not a Hollywood movie. This is a Francis Ford Coppola movie. So it's another very good reason to go see it. Is there a way to guarantee the writer's strikes go on forever? 
Uh, they're beginning to get broke because these people live in Hollywood. They're financially irresponsible. A lot of them are going broke and I don't know how it's going to end. I haven't been following the writer's strike or the actor's strike. My attitude is I just fuck them. I don't care about them. Uh, the, 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 the quality of their work is so, so poor. Like what, what business have they asking for a raise? But at the same time, I don't like organized, uh, organized labor in general. I think if you're a professional, you should just be able to negotiate with your employer by yourself on your own behalf. I wouldn't want to pay money to some organization to negotiate on my behalf. My attitude is I can negotiate for myself. I'm not going to pay you to do it for me. I know what my worth is. My company, I would hope, know what my worth is. And if we can agree on that, I'll get a pay raise. If we can't, I'll quit and I'll get another job. And that's it. That's it. it, it here's a great line from Reservoir Dogs. Back when fucking Hollywood was making good movies and there were good writers working, she don't make enough money, she can quit. Right? That's uh, Mr. Pink says that. Like, honestly, all I have to say to the actors who are saying, oh, you know, I only get paid the, the minimum of $1,300 a day. My attitude is, look, if you don't make enough money, fucking quit and get a different job. All right, cry me a fucking river. You, you know, your $1,300 a day minimum. Get screwed. Most people in the country, they're earning a lot less than that. So you don't like it, just quit. Go get a different job. One where you can negotiate for your own salary. And it's as simple as that. And then another argument that they come up with is, oh, there's not as much work as there used to be. So we should get paid more for the work that, that we do. No, that's not how the free market works. If there's not as much work as there used to be, you move into a different field. There's no, what do you think happened to all those guys who used to work in VHS shops? They moved into a different field when there's not as much work within a certain industry as there used to be. Just move on to a different industry. I've done it. I've changed industries several times in my life. It's fine. Like negotiate on your own behalf. Well, that's my attitude to it anyway, the whole writer's strike. Uh, but I don't follow the day today because I just don't care about it. Enough. I don't care about it enough and I don't talk about it on my channel. I have my opinions on it, but yeah, like I said, I wouldn't I wouldn't make any videos on it or anything. Um, it's just about time says appreciated thanks. Needed a way to explain it in one paragraph, and yes, your review was spot on. Yeah. I mean, if you just if you want to keep it very simple, just the movie glorifies power. Power is a bad thing. And I think that's enough to condemn the movie on a at least from a moral perspective. Um Andrew says, I go to an all boys school. I went to an all boys grammar school for seven years. Um, it does suck, not going to lie. But at the same time, there are the benefits that, and I know this from, um, from teaching for years, when you have a classroom full of uh, boys and girls, especially when there's a good equilibrium, like 50, 50, the girls will, uh, they will behave and dress in a way that is almost, it's almost like a biological behavior. They're trying to attract the attention of the boys. And the boys will behave in a way that will that is designed to attract the approval and the attention of the girls. So the, a, a really common one is a guy will try to be funny. Like you'll have a 14, 15 year old boy and he's cracking these really shitty jokes and he's trying to be funny and he's doing it to try to get the girls to laugh. And I think it's, I think it's almost biologically built in. Um, you can't expect a 14 or a 15 year old to be funny. I, I never have anything against, I never had anything against class clowns because they're just they're just responding to their biological instincts to try to make the girls laugh. And, and they're only 14. Of course, they're not going to be funny. They don't understand humor yet. And they haven't really developed a sense of humor, but they're trying. Um, they can be very cruel like, because cruelty is a very crude form of humor. It's one of the, the, the most primitive forms of humor. And it's the first form of humor that a, a young boy will stumble upon in the attempt to impress women. And then he'll move past that once he, re you know, hopefully once he realizes that, okay, that's that's actually not that funny. Um, except, you know, really sadistic people like the people that make Velma, for example, that they decided that cruel humor is actually funny. Um, yeah, all boys school, the advantage is that you don't have the distraction of girls. You're able to just focus on your work. And less teen pregnancies, which is always a good thing. All right. Um, Susie Q, true. Um, but men, hearing men who cry about Barbies should be acceptable. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I have no, no, no argument with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I care about as much about the writer's strike as I do care about Snow White's abhorrent working conditions. Yeah, I, I just don't give a shit. There are bigger things to worry about in the world than the working conditions of Hollywood writers. Um, and Wacy Wall Walker says, dude, you're one of my favorite creators. Well, thank you very much, Wacky Wall Walker. I appreciate you watching the videos and coming onto the chat. 
Uh, every girl who played with Barbies had Ken as the boyfriend, husband, or love interest. It makes no sense to have a Barbie that hates Ken. It does. Absolutely. 100%. Now, I don't, I, I never even thought of it like that because I never played with Barbie. You know, shocker. But from the perspective of little girls, when they played with Barbie, yeah, you're right. Ken was the boyfriend or the husband or the love interest. And yet you've got this movie where they never kiss, they never embrace, they're not living, not love interest. They don't get together at the end of the movie. And it just sucks. Like, it sucks. It's such a terrible ending. All politics aside, the ending of Barbie sucks. It's terrible. It doesn't work. The old lady was awful. And like, I explained it in detail in my video, but man, that, that ending was terrible. It was a terrible ending. Hated it. Um, Jack Mills, uh, thanks very much. He says, I'm also one of his favorite creators. Thank you. Can't wait to see you hit a million soon, man. Soon. Soon. It's going to happen. No, no doubt. It's going to happen. Uh, Melvin deeply. I don't have much sympathy for these actors striking. They want enough pay and residuals to retire for working three weeks a year. hundred percent. Like they want their residuals, which basically means they keep getting paid for work that they did in the past. Do you know how much I get paid for all the work that I did in the past? Like zero. Okay. All the work I did in my 20s, I don't make any money from it, right? This idea of residuals, if you want residuals, then go to the bank, get a loan, make your own movie, and, and take your, the risk yourself, all right? You're the one, you're taking all the risk, you're putting your house up at the bank to get a loan, fair enough, okay? You take the risk, you can get the reward. If the movie's a success, then you can have the, the money that it generates in the future, and you deserve it. But if you're just the actor that shows up on set, why the hell should, why, why, why do you deserve residuals? You didn't invest in it. It's not a risk for you at all. So explain to me why you get to take 0% of the risk, but you get to have a percentage of the reward. But if it's a failure, you're not liable for any of that. So how about this? If you want the residual, that's fine, but you have to take on some of the risk. So if the movie fails, then you go into debt as a result of that. How's that sound? No, didn't think so. See, if these people are serious about wanting long-term income, then you have to, you've got, you've got to make your own stuff. You've got to make your own movie or TV show or comic book or, or write books or whatever. All right. You can't just piggyback on somebody else's work and somebody else's risk and insist that you should be allowed to benefit from that long-term long after your work for that that stuff has been done. I'm so against that idea. It's very anti-free market. I hate it. If you want to be a businessman or a businesswoman, that's great. Go be a businessman. Go to the bank. If you want to be an actor, then show up, act your part, get paid, and fuck off. And stop bothering the people who actually took the risk and put up the money for more money after your, your, your day's work is done. That's my attitude to it. Um... And then DA says, I can understand residuals for big names. Uh, you can damage your brand if the movie is a stinker for people with one line in five seconds. I can understand residuals for big names because it will, it'll help make the movie a success, but that's just part of your negotiating power in business. If you are a big name, um, like a, say a Scarlett Johansson, Scarlett Johansson's a businesswoman, right? She's, she's got her own production company. She's not just an actress. So that's business. She's already a businesswoman and she's already taking risk a lot of the time. If she, if Scarlett Johansson is getting residuals from a movie, it's very likely that part of that deal is that her production company has to invest in the project, either in the form of marketing or in the form of the actual production budget. Or she's contracted to do a certain amount of marketing, which has a, a very high dollar value because her physical presence is worth so much money. So in that case, like if the likes of Scarlett Johansson, I have no problem because she's already a businesswoman and there's already a lot of money involved and a lot of it's her money. So for big name residuals, that's fine. But yeah, one guy showing up to speak one or two lines for five seconds and then he wants to get paid for that 10 years later, get fucked. Like you're a chancer and you know it and everybody else knows it and don't pretend otherwise. All right, so Susie Q, lol. Well, there was still a love interest there. As a young girl, you don't really play dolls as the self-sufficient girl boss who don't need no man, at least in my time we, we didn't. Yeah, I don't imagine playing dolls as a, you know, I'm a guard boss. I don't need no man. I don't need nobody. I'm going to go do it all on my own. It's probably not very fun. You know, when, it, uh, you know, my, my son plays with toys and when he has his little Lego figures, they're playing with each other or they're, they're going to 
town together or going to a cafe together or whatever. They're doing things together. That's natural. Our natural human instinct is to do things together with other people. This idea that Barbie's arc is wonderful because she she goes from being a, a member of a totalitarian matriarchy to a, a self-realized atomized individual. What kind of an arc is that? That's more like an anti-arc. It's awful. Um, if she does have an arc, it's an anti-arc. I don't think she does have an arc in the movie anyway. I think that uh, the, the idea that she has a, an arc is a complete sham because her destruction of the Ken's patriarchy and her complete disenfranchisement of the Ken's proves that she didn't learn anything and that she's the same person at the end as she was at the start. And that's one of the reasons why I think the ending is so deeply evil. So Susie Q, oh, hold on, uh, Melvin deeply says, I used to dig graves with a pick and shovel, hard work. Assuming these coffins are still in their graves, should I still be getting paid? Exactly. Nope, the job ends when you clock out. That is exactly right. When you clock out, the job ends. Uh, and that's it. Now, if the grave was still generating money, maybe you can have an argument for that. But um, like with TV shows and, and movies, they, they do still generate money long term. But the fact is, why should the actors specifically get residuals. I mean, why not the carpenters? I mean, he said he's, he was he was burying coffins. So if he shows up to a movie set and does a bit of carpentry work, why does he not get residuals, but the actors do? What about the caterers? You know, the people who keep everybody fed on set, do they get residuals? No. Why? Why don't they get residuals? Because the actors showed up, they worked for three hours, they went home, they get residuals. The caterers showed up, they worked for eight hours, they don't get any residuals. And neither the actors nor the caterers invested in the project. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Is it because the actors are, you know, the prettier people and, and, and they're more important than the caterers? No. The, the, like when you actually break down the arguments that the writer, that the actors are making and the writers are making in their strike, they just fall apart completely. It doesn't matter what perspective you view them from. If you view them from a left-wing perspective, go with the caterers argument. If the actors get residuals, why can't, you know, the working man, the caterers get the residuals? All right. From the right wing perspective, it's the free market. If you want to earn money long term on a project, put up your own money, go get a loan. And that's it. So it doesn't matter when you really think about it, it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're coming at it from. Either way, the writers on strike and the actors on strike, they're assholes and they're chancers. And they're just they're trying to get money that, frankly, they don't deserve because and. They, even if the productions were good, I would still disagree with them. But the fact that they've been making such utter shite for the past 10 years, it, it just makes it even more insulting, the idea that they deserve more. Um, okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up. So Susie Q says, lol, we didn't either. It was always playing house. Yeah, just playing house. Kids love playing house. They, they, they don't like taking little figures off on their own. And Wacky Wild Walker says, it's good that she don't need no man because I can't imagine any man wanting that. Um, I mean, that's obviously true for, for body positive Barbie, but I will say what one thing I'll give Margot Robbie credit for. I think she was good in the movie. Like the acting was good. Uh, there's this meme online, apparently that Margot, I've discovered it since researching Barbie, that Margot Robbie is mid. I've heard this rumor. It's not true. She's not mid. She's, <laughs> she's just not. Um, some people said, I, I don't agree. Don't agree at all. Controversial topic, I know, but uh, that's my, my take on it. Um, all right. The little people should strike and make the spoiled actors do the hard work. Yeah, exactly. The actors don't even consider the fact that there's a lot of people working around them that are never going to get the kind of pay increase that they're asking for. Um, all right. So I'm just going to wrap it up here. I enjoyed chatting with everybody in the chat. And thank you very much for listening and tuning in and for watching the videos and everything else. All right. Have a great day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.